So, how long have you been politically active? Um, well, politically active, I think uh, I joined the National Organization for Women when I was 19, and I did clinic protection back then when we were still screaming about Roe versus, Roe versus Wade and um, not allowing women the right to choose what they did with their bodies. And so I remember being on a, uh, there was a group in uh, the 90s called Operation Rescue. This guy, Randall Terry or Terry Randall, I, I've blocked his name for all these years. Um, he was screaming about how abortion was murder and women should not be allowed to do this. I mean, it's the same argument they're still making now. So, you know, 20, oh my gosh, I'm old. 20 years ago, <laughs> I started getting involved with the idea that um, women should have a right. I can't add. Is that 30 years ago? Oh, I hope not. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad I'm an English teacher and not a math teacher. I'm, I'm about to have a heart attack about how old I am. Um, anyway, no, I've been, and but but something happened in November that changed that um, I became not necessarily politically active in my career choice, but I did become um, aware of educational opportunity. So becoming a teacher, I've always worked in low income, high diversity uh, schools. I worked at Boys Republic, which is a school for criminal boys, uh, young men incarcerated between the ages of 13 and 19. I taught reading because some of the kids had made it all the way to 13, 14, 15 years old and still couldn't read. And then I worked with the GED program for 17 year olds who arrived to us with maybe five to 25 credits, had no hope of graduating high school, so we needed to give them an opportunity to get that certificate so they could then go on to junior college, a trade school or something like that to get back into the workforce and kind of break that cycle. So activism for education, empowering young people, um, that I've been doing that for 10 years, but November um, when I stopped hyperventilating and I stopped being sad, um, I got a little angry, started going on um, protests and things. I uh, was at the Ontario airport protesting the Muslim ban, uh, went to a prayer vigil that was an interfaith uh, sponsored by um, the Islamic Society in Corona. I started following Calvert around because it was really, I knew that he had won every single year for as, as longer than I've even been in the community. And I hadn't paid that much attention to him because I figured, um, as we've discussed before, that our district was too red and I would continue to vote for the Democrat and then that would be the best that I could do. But I had no idea that we would go so far backwards um, in November. Um, regardless of whether you voted for Hillary or you wanted Bernie, the reality was is that most of us, at least I thought so, most of us would never have let somebody like Donald Trump become the president of the United States with all the things that he'd said. And then paying attention to the fact that my congressional leader in this district, who's supposed to represent me and everyone, over 700,000 people in this community, was then buying into the Trump agenda hook, line, and sinker 100%. And as I started looking, really looking at what my representative was doing, I realized I could no longer sit back and just think it was enough to educate young people, think it was enough to go to the polls and vote. And, and I was inspired to um, really, because I'm very vocal, because I'm very strong, because I'm very independent, because I'm really not afraid of talking about what I do believe is right and wrong, I put myself out there. And it's been, um, it's been an interesting, ride. It's quite the roller coaster. Um, as we were talking earlier before we started recording, you get a lot of people who then decide that they know who you are by a couple of Facebook posts. Right. Lots of advice on the kind of candidate that I should be. Lots of advice on um, you know, the words that I should use, uh, how, what, how I should take my position stances and that sort of thing. And, and it's, you know, a lot of it, it's, it's not, I don't want to discount any of it, but I also know that one of the most important things about running for office is maintaining uh, my, my personal truth. Um, I am a very vocal person. I have to watch my sarcasm, I know that. I have to watch my vocal outbursts against people that I disagree with. However, that doesn't change fundamentally what I stand for and, and what I believe that most of our community stands for if we really start having some honest, open conversations. So was it in November that you decided you were going to run for office, or did that come later? Um, actually, I, um, I was elected on a slate of progressives for an assembly delegate position here in the 67th, representing um, Menifee, Murrieta, Lake Elsinore, Wildemar, Winchester, and some of those areas. So w 
holding our state assembly member accountable. Mm -hmm. And so I'm an assembly delegate to the California Democratic Party. And uh, that happened because the California Teachers Association, of which I'm a member as well, sent a message saying, hey, these assembly delegate positions are coming open because they are elected every um, odd year in January. And they said, so by December 8th, look for your assembly district. You can put, in, put your name in the hat in the ring and then write a little blurb, pay, pay $20 to get your name on the, on the ballot and go. And so I did it. I thought, you know, December 7th, I'm in typing what I represent, had a friend of mine uh, take a look at what I was saying and, and then submitted it, showed up on January 8th at the, I think it was the VFW in, 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 in Menifee and over 80 people showed up and I ended up getting um, tied for the highest vote count. And That's just awesome. basically, well, yeah, I, it really felt amazing. Um, you know, I had been in positions organizing for my union when I was in the Chino Valley Unified School District, um, very active and vocal in my department and things of that nature, but I had never gone outside into the public sphere to run for anything. So that was my first foray into that. And after I did that, I met this amazing group of people who were also inspired by the election to get off the sidelines and really jump into things in the same way that I had with the assembly delegate position. And the more I started talking to them about my activism and my thoughts and ideas and based upon my personality, um, I, I got a lot of people encouraging me uh, to run. You should, Julia, you should run. And then I, I started thinking about it and I had people at protests for Calvert say, you know what, you really should run. You really should run. There was something about my fearlessness in leading a group of people and being a voice that made me realize that maybe I do have something more to say and more to do than just showing up at protests. But the, the assembly delegate thing was the first thing, and I got to go to the California uh, Democratic Convention in May, and that was really um, exciting, eye-opening. Um, the, the who's who of California politics, all the mm -hmm. way Kamala Harris spoke, Nancy Pelosi spoke, there are all these people that showed up. I met the Attorney General of California. I mean, it just really was kind of incredible. And then a lot of new activists who were inspired by what we thought was the tragedy of 2016 to really jump in and make a difference. So that's, uh, that's, that was kind of the catalyst for me to actually take this next step to run for Congress. What, uh, what exactly made you decide to run for Congress specifically instead of maybe state legislator? Um, well, a couple of things. Um, I believe um, I, it's, the, it's the current administration and some of the cabinet members that really inspired me to look beyond what's going on in California because despite um, some of the hiccups in California, despite the fact that we have um, a Republican assembly member here in the 67th, the, I still feel like California gets it right. California didn't vote for Donald Trump even though and Riverside County finally turned blue for Hillary Clinton, even though the 42nd still voted for Donald Trump. Um, and so I feel like the, the type of diversity that we already have in California tends to keep us on a smoother, more forward thinking track. Um, as far as education and the kinds of things that we're doing. And that doesn't mean that California is perfect, but I do think that, uh, you know, we go blue all the time. And, and I think, I think that the need has more to do with these national policies of education and stopping people like Betsy DeVos from um, gutting our public school system. Um, and she's not qualified. You know, and people will make that same argu argument about me. Well, you're not qualified either. Well, neither was Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln wasn't qualified to be president of the United States. He failed in two Senate runs. And I am no Abraham Lincoln, but I'm talking about when people say, well, you don't have experience. Elizabeth Warren, is a brand new senator, Patty Murray. Um, these, are, these are powerful women and powerful people who decided, you know what? I have a voice. I have these things that I believe in. I don't think we're being represented. And so I'm gonna run and I'm gonna see what happens. And, and a lot of them, and not all of them, but a lot of them have turned out to be really positive, empowering representatives for their communities, their states. And so California seems to me like they're in, we're in good hands, but we're not nationally. We're not in good hands nationally. We're not in good hands with the Attorney General. And this idea of mass incarceration and all of these things that he wants to do, ultimate punishment, the maximum sentences for drug offenders, but the education, we don't, we don't put any money into rehabilitation. We don't put any money into communities. That affects us. If you talk to the residents of Menifee who keep having their mail stolen, 
Calvert keeps saying, well, there's a meth problem, and so we need to make the penalty for mail fraud, mail theft, you know, maximum, you know, 10 years or whatever. And I'm thinking, no, we need to create economic opportunity. We need to have programs that help people get off drugs, deal with their addiction, so that they can stop needing to steal from people to feed this addiction. And so, I, I mean, it just, it, there's a national issue. Like, it's bigger than California. Yeah, basically, just overall, you think that federally we need more of a more of a liberal influence, and California is already yeah. well enough in that direction I do. that it doesn't. Need and even we don't even have to call it liberal. I think it's open-minded and inclusive. I mean, I, this this current administration is pretty wealthy and pretty white. Okay, and I know I'm a white woman. <laughs> no, but I'm, like, I'm the first one to admit. But I, I'm not going to apologize for being born white, and so I've spent my career. And, That's nice to know, <laughs> right? And I've and I've made. But the thing is, it's like I had no control over that. I had absolutely no control over my birth, the fact that I was born in the United States, the fact that I was born to the parents I was born to, and so what matters is what I do with that privilege. It exists. Exactly. And we, it exists. I know it exists, and I keep telling people. I even told my students this because my students are part of the reason I decided to run as well. I can affect 170 to 200 kids every day at school. What if I could make a positive difference for millions of children in the United States? Low-income kids, kids that come from trauma, right? And so I told my students, there is a table in our society, and the white guys are sitting at it. And the wealthier you are, the more seats you have at the table. White women, we're in the room because we're white. My job as a white woman who believes in equality, opportunity, diversity, experiences that, that transcend my own little life bubble, my job is to keep my foot in that door no matter how many times they slam it to let everybody else get in the room as well. Because eventually when everybody else gets in the room, we're going to make either a bigger table or we're going to start kicking the people out that don't see us because we're female, because we're black, because we're Hispanic, because we're Asian, because we're Muslim, because we're atheist, whatever it is. And that's, that's a huge responsibility that I've taken on myself. Yeah, that's the same mentality that got women's suffrage and racial equality and sexual equality and everything right. throughout history. Yeah, if I have influence and I can use that influence for the greater good, then I have to use it. I have to use it. If you're gonna take me more seriously because I'm white, then by God, I'm gonna be yelling at you about it. I'm gonna be holding you to task about it. And I get dismissed because I'm female. I've been mansplained about my lack of experience by a white man whose Facebook page has all of his children with rifles. Like, I wouldn't ever do that. I would never put a gun in the hand of my kid for a fun picture. I don't care if it was Knott's Berry Farm or not, right? But he's telling me all these things I don't know how to do. And somebody asked him, are you, thanks for the mansplanation. I'm sure Julia appreciates it. Are you going to make sure that this other candidate that just got into the race, you're going to make sure to let him know that he's inexperienced as well? Or is that just safe for Julia? So I get discredited because I'm a woman. I understand that. It's not going to stop me. It's not going to stop me. And if I can stand up and be heard for whatever allows me in the conversation, I'm going to be heard. And then I'm going to keep my hand held on everyone else who deserves to be heard. I'm going to drag them with me until we're all standing together. And nobody has to be behind me anymore because of skin color, economic opportunity, educational level, whatever it is. Did I soapbox there? God, that felt good. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I know a lot of I know a lot of conservative people would typically um, just kind of push off whatever you're saying just because you're a woman, or push off what other people are saying because they might be minority races. But um, we've we've had plenty of encounters where people, liberal people, completely discount what we say because we're white men. Right, and that's not any more fair either. I think we have to start listening to the conversation and stop gauging its validity based upon who's making the points. I mean, you know, um, you probably get uh, discounted just because you have long hair. You probably get discounted because you're younger, right? I've, there, well, yeah, I've, I've really never had. Well, that's good. Yeah. That's good. But I do know that if you're having conversations with people, the first thing we do is, is look. That's like the whole idea that um, people being colorblind. No, 
that's that's not you can't be colorblind you say you're colorblind number one you're ignoring everybody's personal experience based on what color they are what color their skin is and second of all you start stereotyping people so if you get discounted because you're white males then we're not doing a good job those of us that aren't white males to give you that voice because it really should matter about your character it should matter your character it should matter your heart it should matter the things you're saying and the things that you stand for regardless of what color you are wouldn't that make you colorblind though if you're only looking at those things and not no it absolutely wouldn't but it is if you are discounted because of the color of your skin then that's just that's that's racist right yeah i don't i'm not talking about well here's the deal right as if you are a Hispanic woman, your life experience is going to be completely different and come from different, um, well, you're, not just your life experience, but everything, what you bring to the table is going to be based in part on that identity as a Hispanic woman. Same thing as being a black man or a, a lesbian or a transgender. There is a life experience that you cannot deny based upon those particular identities or however it is we choose to identify. So we have to acknowledge that. Not right. And that's just the world we live in today. And what your goal is, is to get away from that. Get away from what? Um, the the cultural ideology and thought of that that even matters. You know... If we got to a point where that wouldn't have had any impact or had very little impact to got it. what somebody's life was if like... We, yes, if we get to a level of true equity in the United States of America and we shed our racist past and we start really acknowledging people for those things like character, humanity, and just let people be, then yes, we could just celebrate those things that are different about us, whether it's the culture, the traditions, the food, the, the aspirations, whatever it is, because we're no, no two human beings are ever gonna be the same. I don't know that we are ever going to get there. We are, we are entrenched in this country was built on that kind of racism. This right. country was built on that other. And, and every time we wanted to advance something as, as a society, despite the fact that we're a nation of immigrants, that we're built on the backs of immigrants, that we're, you know, we've been built on the backs of slaves, we still keep finding, and I say we as a collective United States of America, not you, not me. Yeah we still keep finding ways to point fingers at, at the other. We're, and, and so in an ideal world, colorblindness would be real because we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have to base our opinions of people on that. But I don't, know that we, I don't know that we can ever get there. How do you think we would ever go about getting to the point where everyone is colorblind without first taking the step of people actually being colorblind because you you seem to be you seem to be against people be, being quote unquote colorblind i think because it, look because our society is so uh, if we look at certain things like poverty levels um the idea of rural um white people are, are there's poverty in those areas but there's also poverty of in the african-american community in the hispanic community there's a great disparity between their ability to move forward women still only make 75 cents on the dollar and it doesn't matter if you're white or not women still make 75 cents on the dollar to men we have these inequalities they exist i guarantee you when i walk through a store as a white woman, I am not going to be, unless I am obviously shoplifting, I'm not getting followed around by security. But when I talk to my students, I work at a school, there are only 50 white kids out of 2,400. And when I ask my students, how many of you or your parents have been followed around a store by security, almost every single kid in that room raises their hand. That's a different life experience. And I can't pretend that doesn't exist for this idea of colorblindness. Yeah, no, uh, colorblindness wouldn't really be completely ignoring the fact that that happens to people. Colorblindness would be you personally not judging a person based on their color, well, that's, not making any assumptions about them. Right, well that's, that's who I am as a human being, but I see, if I see their color and acknowledge where we are in the United States right now, 
then I validate those things that they go through that I don't as a white person. And that's what I'm talking about. Shouldn't that be gauged on an individual basis, though? I mean, if you see if you see a person of a certain color, you can't definitively know the experience. Of course not. But that but I can also decide that they're not something based on a preconceived stereotype either. And then then if I do that, then we open the conversation, then I can have a conversation, then I can be corrected when I make a mistake. Um, or if I make assumptions, I mean, that is, that opens the dialogue. But if I Im immediately start with someone and just say, I, I don't even know, I, I, I'm, I, I understand what you're trying to say. And I, and I am trying to articulate it to the point it, where it's objective. It's objectivity versus discrimination. I hope so. I hope that's what it's there. coming across. Yeah. Um, because I, we are not at a point where we can afford to be colorblind because we are a racist society. We discriminate based upon race. We discriminate based upon orientation. We discriminate based upon gender. And so until we can move our society where we're not having conversations in our government about continuing to do these things, we are discriminating with the health care bill. We're discriminating against disabled people. We're discriminating against the elderly. We're discriminating against women. We're discriminating against every human being on the planet with a pre-existing condition. Well, sorry, every human being in the United States with a pre-existing condition. Do you think that we're going, California, like I said, when you asked me about running in California, California will do everything it can to protect people's health care. We have the most enrollees in Covered California. We were up and running in the exchange on the Affordable Care Act, which I do not think was perfect. I'm not arguing for that. I actually believe in single payer. However, California is going to do everything it can not to leave people out of health care because that's just what we do. And we know that this is wrong. However, do you think Kansas is going to have the same attitude about that? Arkansas is already talking about cutting. They, I just listened to Marketplace on, on, uh, from PRI on NPR the other afternoon. Yesterday, Arkansas has already made their list of how much cuts they're going to make to Medicaid. And and so there's that, already a lot that never took the Medicaid they never got on the They never took the expansion. They never took the subsidies. Uh, you don't do that. Then you end up, you, you, you can make a great argument against the Affordable Care Act when you don't take any of the benefit of it from the federal government because you expect and want it to fail. So we, we, we discriminate in our society over and over and over and over again. And so we have to acknowledge these f visual differences to not negate those very unique experiences that are different from you walking through the world as a white man, me walking through the world as a white woman, any woman of color walking through the world, a man of color, you know, that they're just, and so as much as I would, as much as I work very, very hard to always be open-minded and just talk to people on a human being level, I'm not like everybody else. There's, there are too many of us that already make that decision. I grew up in a family where as soon as we, we, you know, cars used to not lock automatically, right? You turn the key, the car locks, you didn't used to do that. So we had to lock the doors and we didn't lock the doors. We just didn't think about it until my family was driving through a neighborhood where they saw a black person on the street. And I've just, I can hear the click still as a child, as if somehow some black kid walking down the street means we're going to get robbed in our car. That, that exists still. Did you read the article on Chick-fil-A? No. Oh. They made the owner um, just came out with another statement saying they made record sales when they made a comment, I think it was about not liking gays. And he was so happy with the sales they made over the weekend after he did that that he made another statement, we don't like blacks either. Wow. So what do we do with people like that? I heard about the, the first one. Yeah. I, I never it just heard came out that. again. Wow. Yeah. So we have to have this conversation. How was that phrased? I'm just curious. We, at, uh, if I, I'm trying to picture it, we don't like blacks either. I think it was exactly that's, what he that's said. Just, just blunt like that? Yeah. That's fucking insane. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, my, <laughs> that's my point. So I can talk about the fact that I don't have an issue. 
that I want to learn about your different experiences, that I want to learn about your culture, that I want to learn about your traditions, I want to talk to you about what is important to you. And it turns out a lot of things that are important to us are all the same. We want to have a safe life for our children. We want a good education for our kids. We want a job that rewards us, not just financially, but emotionally and personally. And we want to live in safe communities. And, and we want to have a, a, a nest egg to retire someday so we don't have to work until we're dead. And those are common, but it's easier for me to do that. It's easier for you to do that. Now, that, that's not true for every single white male or white woman, but it's a hell of a lot harder when you add those other things in the mix. Hispanic, black, gay. That's my argument. I want to try to avoid turning turning at least this aspect into a bait. I want to keep this as more of an interview, but I do sure. I do want to ask something going back to the wage gap thing. Please. Um, <laughs> um, that the, well, first off, the the seventy seven cent to the dollar figure is is based on overall earnings, mm -hmm. not. It's not necessarily same job, not necessarily same same hours worked, but I, I find it funny that a lot of people always always bring up that statistic of the seventy seven cents a dollar of women versus men, and sometimes they'll bring up also the racial categories. I can't remember the exact numbers, but they'll always bring up how mm -hmm. how white people also earn more right. than uh, than 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 uh, Latino people mm -hmm. earn more than than black people, but nobody really ever brings up the fact that Asians have the highest earning there. They, they ignore that statistic. Well, um, I, don't, I don't think I'm ignoring it. And you notice that in the racial categories, I haven't mentioned that. There's a stereotype in the Asian community as well, that you're better educated, you're smarter, you're better at science and math. I remember having a conversation with a girl that goes to my school. She's Vietnamese, and she was on my tennis team uh, for a couple of years. And uh, it's very interesting to sit and have that conversation with her about the pressure it puts on her to be perfect. Even teachers, her hmm. classmates, expect her to have all the answers and to know everything. And it, she struggles with depression because of it, because she can't be perfect. And, and of course, then she's torn between two worlds. So, um, you know, I don't have the st statistics, but I, I do know that um, because we have a positive stereotype on the Asian community, that perhaps maybe that's why hmm. they don't bring them up. Perhaps that's why. The stereotype is not that they're lazy. The stereotype is not that they're illegal. The stereotype is they're smart. They're tech savvy. And maybe that's why the conversation doesn't come up. As, as much pressure as it must be, even if I just use the example of the one young woman that I know, how nice, how nice to have, and maybe, maybe it's not, maybe I'm being dismissive, but I, I get stereotyped for being emotional, inexperienced, um, you know, women, blah, blah, blah. I add any kind of moniker that we put on it. You know, if, if, a, if a man is aggressive and he's a go-getter, he's called an aggressive go-getter. I am aggressive and um, I'm a go-getter, but I'm a bitch. Kamala Harris was called hysterical. That goes back to the time when women had no choice about their health care and their husband could take them to the doctor who was a man and say, my wife is hysterical. And then they'd give her a hysterectomy. And if it was really bad, they'd give her an oophorectomy and they'd take her ovaries and her uterus to maybe calm her down. Wow. Yeah, that's where that comes from historically. Hysteria, hysterectomy. Mm. So maybe it's easier, even if it's not fair, for Asians to walk through our society because of the positive stereotype they're given. And maybe that's why it doesn't come up. And I don't have that answer. You notice I keep saying maybe. Yeah. But I think, it's, a, I, I think it's an interesting perspective because I, I, I don't include them in my list of but, that, but you know, maybe maybe that's ignorant on my part as well. I found that funny. Neither side really ever does. Neither right. side really ever picks on the Asians. <laughs> no. We're able to just skate by. No one looks at us. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, that's, you know, that's, that's a really, it's something to think about. Especially, yeah, the pressure that there must be 
to be the smartest and the best and the hardest working and the, all of those things. It can't be easy, even if it may seem like it from the outside. That it's, it seems like a positive stereotype to me, but then if I go back to my student, it's not. It hurts her. Well, it makes it really difficult for her to navigate. I think positive or negative, all of these stereotypes are far too broad because we were, we were raised yeah. in Fountain Valley, which is in a very, very Vietnamese dense neighborhood over in Orange County. Okay. And the sheer number of Vietnamese students there, if you take those schools and calculate their test scores and all the data that you can get against all the other schools around, I I don't know the data myself, but I guarantee you, you won't see significantly high test scores just out of Fountain Valley. So it's a just because there right. are Vietnamese students. Right, it's there. an unearned. Again, it's an, another stereotype. Like you said, stereotypes are way too broad. They're way too broad. They they and 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 it's really tragic too because for every stereotype, there's somebody who fits it. Right. You know, that's but why they started. Th they're that broad. But, but that blanketing you're them, going yeah, to blanketing running. people with yeah. stereotypes is, is, that's tough. Again, it goes back to that same conversation, you know? Yeah, but stereotypes are broad enough. Somebody's bound to fit. Somebody's I mean, bound we're, to we're talking it. about races that contain <laughs> billions of people. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, um, that, that was another thing I always found funny growing up. I mean, nobody ever really did it in a discriminatory way. I was just joking, but people always made comments about how I was really good at math. It must be because I was Asian. Kind of got it from our white dad. <laughs> <laughs> my white dad was the science guy, and I would get my English teacher stuff from my mother, our, but both of my kids are really good at math, and they love the sciences. My daughter's studying environmental management protection, and she's a, I mean, she's up now hugging trees. I love her. It's just amazing what she's doing for her summer internship, but me, it's like, oh, why didn't anybody want to be an English teacher? Teacher. And I got that from my mom, and I got that from, but then my dad's mom. Yeah, I don't know. My dad was logical science brain, and that's just the way it worked. So yeah, again, we go back to okay stereotypes. They don't. Uh, let's I, I, I rip them, crush them. You know that would be lovely. So mentioning your different policy approaches, you're for single pair. I am. You are for social equality. Yep. All of your policy stances seem to line up with justice democrats of yep. course and swing left also the mm -hmm. green party you are perfectly in line with everything that the green party stands for have yes. you thought about the green party at all or are are you a democrat and what what are your thoughts on that i've uh, been registered as a democrat ever since i was old enough uh to vote and I, I feel like I'm a Democrat. I really do. Um, I believe that the, the third and those other parties have value. Um, but I have to be realistic um, as well. This, our country is not like the UK. It's not like Germany. It's not like France. It's not like any of the countries that have multi-party elections. We have two parties. And whether that's right or wrong, whether it should be changed or not, whether independence shouldn't be, um, you know, dismissed out of hand, uh, or Green Party, you know, whatever. I, I think I had an issue years ago. Um, was it Ross Perot? There were all of these different things that happened during different elections during the primaries, and I remember I felt like um, Gore suffered in 2000 from the Green Party. And, and we ended up with George W. Bush then for four years and, and an election that the Florida um, Democrats were screaming, you know, hanging chads and all of those kinds of things. So it's, I've gotten that question before, but I feel like I'm, I'm a progressive Democrat. I still feel like the Democratic Party is my home even if there are, it's in turmoil right now, and I do believe that it is in turmoil, and I, I, I don't know um, how we can fix it, but I know that we have to fix it, or we are going to never see Democrats in power again. 
Um, but I think they're an inclusive party. I think Democrats should be if we are getting back to the grassroots of the Democratic Party. It's a party uh, that everyone's welcome. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have such a difficult time getting out a clear message or having a clear direction, you know, establishment versus progressive or whatever, is because um, we have to spend a lot of time answering to everyone. And when you can have a message um, like the Republican Party, and if I'm stereotyping, I apologize, but when you can have a message of, you know, the other is coming for your money, the Democrats are coming for your guns, and we're going to give you your jobs, and you really need to be afraid of this, and so we're going to give you law and order, and we're going to protect you from terrorists, and you can get people really scared about all of these outside groups. You, you maintain a party that, that stays pretty darn white. Um, and we don't, we don't, we can't afford to do that. And we don't do that in the Democratic Party. So everyone gets to be a part of the Democratic Party. We're the diverse party. We're the inclusive party. We're the, the everybody should have a fair shake party, you know, and, and, and not even just equality, but equity. Equity. It's totally different than equality. Oh, it most certainly is. Right? And so I'd like to argue equity. Like, you know, if, if it's, it's just like, even in, even in education, California has um, the local control funding formula and every district has to have a local control accountability plan where they get all their stakeholders, the teachers, the parents, students involved in deciding how the money gets spent. Well, guess what? We have a list of kids that require more help. Now, special education students are not on the LCFF. They're not in the LCAP. Why? Because they're protected by federal law, Individual with Disabilities Education Act. We got those kids protected, which is why we got to stop Betsy DeVos because she's going to decimate that too. However, foster youth, socioeconomically disadvantaged, and English learners. Those are the three subgroups of students. Based upon your numbers in your school, we're going to give you more money from the state of California, the Department of Education. Why? Because that creates equity. If we put more money towards programs for English learners so that they can become English proficient, then everybody benefits. If we make sure that our foster youth who move over and over and over and over again because we have a very struggling children's services um, system in the United States, we don't put enough money toward making sure that these kids don't fall through the cracks and they get the emotional and social support that they need. So the state of California decided to do that in education. And then we have socioeconomically disadvantaged kids because generational poverty is real. It's real. It is very, very difficult. Only, what, what did I hear? What's the statistic? And if I get it wrong, I apologize. My understanding is only 6% of people born, in, young men born in poverty will actually get out of it. I heard another statistic related to that. Uh, Canada actually has greater economic mobility than America does, yeah. which so, is the American dream. Yeah. They also have the lowest income disparity of any nation in the world. Right, and they have socialized medicine. And that doesn't make me a socialist, it makes me a humanist. To believe that nobody should benefit off of people's ill health that CEOs, corporate executives should not get $65 million bonuses for the year because they managed to turn a profit off of death. I, 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 I just, I, that makes me want to beat my head against the wall. But equity, <laughs> right? Right there. <laughs> equity. You don't, equity. You don't need to preach right. universal health care on us. Oh, yeah. Equity, Especially me. Right? <laughs> equity means that if we have to give extra money to make sure that the disadvantaged have that opportunity to pull out of their disadvantage, then we have to be, we have to spend that money. Because when we look at the reverse, what do we have to then provide if we have a low income student who doesn't get the best education that we can possibly give them, who doesn't have economic mobility that we're talking about? What we end up with is another cycle, another generation of people that have to require um, the social net programs, the safety net programs like TANF and um, SNAP and all of these kinds of things. When, if we don't spend on those programs, if we put it into education first. 
and why people don't see that and don't understand that and look at it as a handout is beyond me. Great kid, great kid named Max, um, actually this other kid named David, um, that I used to teach at Boys Republic. He was one of the smartest kids I'd ever met. And I, I used to look at him, I said, David, I swear to God, I hope when you get out of here, you start using your brain for good and not evil because you are a mad genius. He was brilliant. Everything came very easy for him. Horrible. His mother was too young. His grandparents had to adopt him. He ended up getting involved in gangs in Pasadena and he ended up in Boys Republic because he was caught and incarcerated and smoked every GED test with some of the highest scores I had ever seen. And so we got him applying to Pasadena City College and we had a, a person on, on campus who was just there to help students with their financial aid application and that sort of a thing. So I'll never forget, he was getting ready to leave. His program was up and he was graduating out of Boys Republic and he had already applied for college and, and he came into my classroom and he goes, Peacock, I just got a debit card today. And I said, really? He goes, yeah, it's for, my co it's for college. I said, oh yeah, he goes, it's $6,600. He said, why would they give a thug like me $6,600 to go to college? I said, because they don't want you to be a thug like you anymore. Because if we give you $6,600 of taxpayer money, you are gonna, and you go to college, and you do what maybe you were meant to do instead of what you got hooked up with, I said that I'm gonna save hundreds of thousands of dollars on you as a taxpayer because you're not gonna to have to be in jail. I'm not gonna to have to house you in a maximum security facility with my tax dollars. And eventually you'll have a career and an opportunity that if you decide to have a family, your children will have better opportunities. And I won't ever see them in a place like Boys Republic. And that's why I don't understand when people get pissy. I don't want my tax dollars to pay for that. You want them to go pay for incarceration instead then. Because how's that working out for us? Lots of Jeff Sessions is arguing for. I know, isn't he awesome? <laughs> it, it, again, I mean, like you said, don't really want to stereotype, but it does seem like a lot of conservatives don't think past the immediate effect. Right. <laughs> no, which is strange to me because a lot of people will say I'm a fiscal conservative. Don't you dare tell me you're a fiscal conservative if you don't want to spend any money on education. Don't you dare. I'm a fiscal conservative but I'm also progressive, right? and I think long-term. That's it. Don't, yeah, so you can be a fiscal conservative, which means what you want is the money to be spent wisely. And since incarceration isn't working, how about education? Exactly. Right? Um, if the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies and the medical equipment companies are just getting richer off the backs of sick and dying people, how about single payer? Single payer? The conservatives are going to save money on that. People are going to save tons of money. Employers will save tons of money. And I don't Actually, understand. Actually, most of the conservatives aren't going to save any money on that. Because conservative politicians. The conservative yeah. politicians will. Oh, right. And the CEOs will. But the conservative base won't. They're still going to lose out. How, how so? They're still going to be the ones paying for all the insurance. They're the ones that are going to be funding the, the insurance companies. Not with single payer? No, on, on the policies that the right-wingers Oh, the now, right -wingers the play. AHCA. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I'm like, wait a minute, no what, no what? <laughs> uh, no, yes, you're right. This current policy, even the Affordable Care Act, it didn't go far enough. Right. Single payer changes that. It changes that for everyone. Right. It puts money back in the pockets of average Americans, even the poor. We, we end up with businesses saving money. I mean, imagine all of a sudden if businesses don't have to spend the thousands of dollars. And in California, you have 50 or more employees. You're paying for health insurance. That's a law, mm -hmm. right? Now, from birth to death, it's one price. You need an MRI, that's how much an MRI costs. And, in, and businesses are not paying. They're gonna make more, they're gonna make money. It's like an 8% gain. Uh, University of Massachusetts just came out with a study in May. 8% gain for um, middle America and a two to 3% gain for all businesses, period. Because people think, oh, I'm gonna pay more taxes and no premiums and no deductibles and no right. co-pays. Yeah, My I mean, employer specifically <laughs> on our contract that we have through our union 
pays sixteen hundred dollars per employee per month. Per month. Mine is about the same. I pay three seventy five a month um, for eleven months of the year as a teacher, but I have better insurance coverage. My union negotiated stronger with my um, art school district because the classified employees, those are the ones that most don't have the college degree. They, they're not credentialed teachers. They're the custodians and the secretaries and clerks and those types. Mm -hmm. I've, got, I've got a gal that I work with that is on the Affordable Care Act because she can't afford the employer coverage. It's wow. too much for her family of four. The ACA was cheaper. They, okay, so not even all employer coverage works. And when you argue, well, I, I don't pay any. There are people that don't pay anything out of pocket. Their employer pays yeah. 100%. Okay, so here's what that means. Here's what the American Health Care Act, or a better plan for America, whatever the heck they're calling it now, the Senate. And here's the deal. Talk about that economic opportunity, you're stuck. I hope yeah. you love the job you're in and you plan to stay there for the rest of your life because if you leave that job that pays 100%, you go back into pre-existing condition pool. Exactly. So what you're doing is you're relegating the entire workforce to mm. never wanting more out of their job. So that would have meant, because I had insurance with my husband, my husband had insurance. My husband was a purchasing agent years ago and he did not make very good money, but we had good insurance and we were having a baby. We couldn't afford for him to quit his job. So he stayed in a very low paying job that had really good insurance benefits. And he didn't take a new job with a new company until they guaranteed to keep our insurance benefits for us. So they paid our COBRA for a year so that we could keep the well baby care that we had for our daughter and be wow. allowed to see the pediatricians that we wanted. So we had to negotiate that when he got his new job and he did make better money. He's now been promoted to purchasing manager for his company. We still get the insurance out of my company. If, if we had not been willing to take that jump and take that leap and go from a PPO to an HMO at my husband's new job, my husband would still be working for a company that doesn't pay well, no long-term benefits, and we don't, wouldn't have the kind of opportunity that he was given. Because the original company he was with, he started literally as the mailroom clerk. And they, that's just how they looked at him, as the mailroom clerk. But this new company made him a buyer, and they saw his potential. And so they rewarded him for it and promoted him just recently. If we had had to stay because just because of insurance, we wouldn't be where we are now. And that is really a very, very serious side effect of these healthcare plans. Sometimes I sometimes I feel bad because uh, my my dad said he he hated his job back, way back when and he, he said he was considering quitting but then I was born right and he was getting fantastic health insurance right. through his work he's he's had to stay there now for twenty two years because we granted now he's a manager now he's in a better place right but he, but it took him a really long time to yeah, get there and, but he's he's essentially he essentially feels obligated to stick there until I'm twenty six right. Right. I, I have no idea where we could have been if he was allowed to look elsewhere. Who knows? Yeah. I'm now working at the same place, and I have the same health care. And you've I... got two little ones, so you know exactly what it means to have that kind of health care. Yeah. But you guys are also union as well, mm -hmm. and there's a certain protection that comes from that. That's right. one of the reasons when we go back to talking about um, disparity in wages, equal work, equal pay, I don't have to worry about that because I'm a union. Right. So I make, I'm, I make money based upon how many years of service and how much education, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter that I'm a woman. Doesn't matter that I'm vocal and I irritate people. I'm good for kids. My students learn, they aspire to be who they wanna be because I don't go in and try to save them. I go in and try to empower them to find the spark that already exists in them. But I'm protected by a union and you want to look at income inequality, it has gone exponentially higher, this inequity we have in the United States based upon the decline in unions. Mm -hmm. the, the graph is unreal. What was it, 1968, I believe, was when people were making the most for their dollar. Absolutely. I mean, think of all the people that were able to buy homes. Think of the suburbs, how they started growing how people were able to drive to their jobs but live in communities where there are parks 
and schools and they didn't have to live in the cities anymore and and those are that was union that was that unions helped do that and so the fact that the the people on the right are talking about unions as a dirty word all that does all that means that doesn't mean you don't make money that just means that the people who are doing all of the hard work for you actually get to take home something they can be proud of they don't have to you know, mcdonald's i know mcdonald's is not a union but they were trying to get unionized right fast food workers were trying to unionize was it mm -hmm. the summer before this one i think last year i think I we were talking about, about the 15 dollar minimum wage and there were employees you know kind of trying to strike whatever mm -hmm. McDonald's has an employee helpline on their corporate webpage. I need assistance, whatever. So NPR had one of the McDonald's employees that you know, did an interview and, and she called. And the person on the other end of the line that is hired by the corporation to talk to people about what they can do if they're running into economic trouble. Well, have you checked into welfare? The corporation of McDonald's recommends to their struggling employees that they go on public assistance. They don't offer better wages. Mm -hmm. They don't offer consistent work hours. They tell their employees to check into public assistance. Most places <laughs> in the United States, I think uh, somebody did this study not that long ago, either 12 or 20 counties, I think it's 12 counties, you can afford to live in the United States if you're making minimum wage and working 40 hours 12 a week. counties. 12 counties. In the whole the in, United in States. In the whole United States. That's, that's, that's nauseating. And I'm yeah. not, that's, that is, talk about deplorable, that's deplorable. That's unreal. Also, I wrote an article a few weeks ago um, about minimum wage and living wage and everything. For a family like I have here, I'm the only one working, I'm the only one with an income. We have two adults and two children. Living wage on average in the state of California is $29 an hour for one income. Yep. I make $29 an hour. That means I am living paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. Yep. So what do you do when you're I working at McDonald's and making ten fifty? I also have the best contract with the best pay at my local union. <sighs> it's a problem. It's a problem. And it, Which, though, granted, is not the union for this area. No, it is Just not the fair. union for this area. That's the union that we have in L.A. But also the standard of living over there, or the... The cost of living over there is a lot higher. It is. Well, um, and that's some, one of the reasons. Somebody was saying on the, the wage that we get there, they can't afford an apartment. No. And they're single. You know what? And I, I know exactly what you're talking about because non-union, my husband isn't in a union. Um, we were living in Ventura County when we started having kids and we couldn't afford to buy a home. So when we first, when my husband moved in uh, to his new position, we started commuting from our rental. Um, he was spending upwards of two hours one way on the freeway to go to work and eventually we realized that when he was working in Irvine We couldn't have afforded to live in Orange County. That was crazy in our budget We would have had like a one-bedroom if we were lucky And so we ended up moving to the Inland Empire where it was less expensive to live So I can completely understand you moving here and living everybody, in this community. Yeah, everybody that's, is doing it Yes, that's, that's why our parents originally moved here and got this yep. because they could afford to have a, a house big enough to fit us all right Whereas they were all working out in Orange County. Yep, exactly. Exactly. And of course, then we were talking about congestion and the freeways, and then we have the toll road, and there's so many things right. going on that make sure, I mean, maybe it's a little bit easier for you based upon the fact that you work nights that you don't... It's miss, a little bit easier. A little bit easier, <laughs> but still traffic, you know, and that's mm -hmm. that's the hours that we spend on the, on the freeways in this area to be able to afford to have a home and to provide for our families is we, we there there's a price for all of that um, as well because you've got to go somewhere else to get really good jobs now I'm fortunate because I'm an educator so I can stay but I have a, a colleague of mine who lives in Orange and are actually Anaheim and she commutes because her husband is in construction so he has to live to near where he works because he can't waste hours on the freeway back and forth mm -hmm. he's got to he's got to get he so she makes the commute all the way out to uh, Paris, where we teach. Wow. 
from Anaheim. And, you know, she's got two little ones. And, I mean, you know exactly what we're talking about, you know, the sacrifices that we have to make to be able to afford to keep a roof over our head and food on the table and the bills paid. We're not talking about a boat. We're not talking about all of these other fancy things. Yeah, I mean, even my mom, who's a manager where we work, she, she sometimes has to stay out there because she can't afford the commute constantly. Right. But she did that last night. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's kind of amazing. It's really kind of amazing. Um, and so if we don't, if we don't provide economic opportunity and we relegate people to staying in jobs that they don't necessarily like or, or well, I'd go back to school, but I can't afford the student loans or I would change jobs, but I can't lose my health insurance. We're in, we're going to, we're going to shift the economic disparity is going to get even worse. And, and this is one of the worst times in history for the economic disparity in the United States. We, we look like a third world country. And I'm, and I, you a know lot what, of look, places it does equate to a third world it country. It does. Yeah. And that's appalling. This democracy, this country, this world leader. Yeah. How, how are we, what, what are we doing? And it's not getting better. That's why I'm running for Congress. Because this is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. I'm, t I'm tired of having these conversations with people who can't make ends meet. What are we gonna do with the over 65 group? What are we gonna do with our older community members when social security check comes in and it's seven or $800 a month? And then they have to pay, out of, they don't get Medicaid anymore? They, they what? What are, you, what are you gonna do? Oh. We'll, we'll just let them die? How the, what society does that? What kind of a country do we live in where we toss aside old people and, and steal the benefits that they've worked their whole lives for? I, I don't get it. I don't get it. it. It's disgusting. It is disgusting. And it makes me, it infuriates me. When people say, well, you know, don't you dare look at me and tell me you're pro-life when you don't want to pay for education and you don't want to pay for daycare and Head Start programs. What makes me want to bang my head against the wall is the fact that it's exactly those old people that are typically the voter base voting for these conservatives. I am constantly stunned and amazed by people who vote against their own self-interest. But again, when you scare people, when you scare people and you run Fears. emotional campaigns based upon... Big, you know, touching the button of people's greatest fears, you can get a lot of really bad things done. You can get a lot of really bad things done when you start telling people that, um, well, these people are going to steal your jobs. Oh, these people want you to, you know, you, we want you to lose your home. They want to, they want to take from you. Whatever, whatever message you package in that somebody's coming to take this from you, you get a lot of people to do a lot of really, really unfortunate things against themselves. And it's really, it's d very difficult. And in the age of, and, you know, in the information age, it's not getting, it's not getting better. It's getting more diluted and twisted. And, you know, I'm, I'm constantly amazed when people want to argue with me and they're using Breitbart as their example. Okay. I, I, at, what, what, at what point do I just go, never going to change your mind. <laughs> and it's really unfortunate. Um, people are connected, and it's never made us more disconnected. Yeah, I was having this conversation with a guy at work last night. Yeah. I, I just, and I, I don't have all the answers, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges about putting myself in the, in the public eye. I really don't have all the answers, but th number one, I'm not going to have to do any of this by myself, you know, when, when I'm elected. I'm not going to have to do this by myself. There, I'm going to, I, I, you know. When? Talk. There's some confidence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You have to go into things with confidence. You know, when I, when I, you know, I made it to UCLA because I believed that I could. And I got, I got I pretty much come from nothing. <laughs> I got, I worked my butt off to get where I am now. Um, and I have to, you know, I have to be really honest um, that I'm in the top 20% with the dual income that we, my husband and I have. You know, I have, it's like, well, what, well, how can you relate? Well, let's talk about what happened before I got an education. The 30 years it took my husband to reach this position in his industry. This did not happen overnight. He did not go get an MBA and walk in, and, and, and 
kudos to people who have an MBA. I'm not, not talking about that, but my husband put 30 years starting as a mailroom clerk in the electrical industry before he made it to purchasing manager. It took him 30 years to get where he is now. So he's worked his butt off. His mother went to college for 12 years, worked full time and raised a family with her husband of 42 years and became a lawyer. That's incredible. That determination, right? So I came from nothing. I came from absolute nothing. Everything that I have, I fought for. So I'm not lost on how, if given the right opportunities, because I was going to junior college. I went back to junior college after my husband and I had our daughter, year and a half old. And I was sitting with dinner with my mother-in-law who had done this 12 years and, and gotten her law degree and she's still, well, well, but of course she's still working and has no pension, so she's gonna be 71 this year. And she tells us, not jokingly, that she'll work till she dies. Because she works, she doesn't get, make the kind of money that you would think a typical lawyer makes. And she believes more in loyalty than her own opportunity. So she's now laid off two days a week. She only works three days a week at her wow. job. So she's laid off. She has four day weekends every weekend. And if you think that's great, it's not. Because she's a 71 year old. No, you can't go home uh -uh. and pay your bills. Nope. No, the only good news is, even though they've lived in their house for over 30 years, um, she, it's refinanced a mortgage, she only pays $1,000 a month, but on the days that she's laid off, she has to get an unemployment check too. Wow. Right? Yeah. So, even though she worked, she went to law school, didn't pan out as well as it could have, say, had she gone to work for a major firm and not done family law in Ventura County, but uh, you know, I, I went to a public high school and I graduated with honors and then went to junior college and thought it was high school with ashtrays and dropped out and went into the workforce and made $7.25 an hour as a receptionist for a small um, uh, entertainment company that used to do some of those really fun shows like the divorce court and stuff like that. Nice. It was, oh my gosh, and we, we'd have to watch the episodes and it was just like mind numbing, but that's okay. It was a job and you know, but I was making $7.25 an hour. I moved out of my parents' house because I owe my dad and my stepmom because it was time to go. Um, bounced a rent check. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things that I experienced. And then um, didn't, I got married when I was 26. And my, like I said, my daughter was a year and a half and, and we were sitting um, with my mother-in-law and I said, you know, I really want to go back to college, but it's going to take forever. And she just looked at me and kind of slammed her fork down on the table. And she said, time's going to pass anyway what are you going to have to show for it? Oh, that was kind of a <laughs> kick in the pants I needed. So I did. I went back to junior college, finished all my lower division, and did so well um, that I ended up, I got the Cal Grant because we were poor. We were, we were broke. We were living paycheck to paycheck in a, in a condo that eventually got sold out from underneath us. You know, oh, by the way, I'm selling. You've got 30 days. You can buy it if you want. It's like, I, I, I can't afford to buy it. So, you know, running around doing the mad dash to try to find new housing and everything's, you know, it's great that you have you pay your rent at this point, but then the next place you go to, it's like $500 more a month because price, right. anyway, whatever. So, and so I went, I went back to college. My husband was working full time and going to school part time. And I was working part time and going to school full time. And eventually I did so well in junior college that I got, um, a full ride to UCLA between Cal grants and scholarships and um, and so I got my degree and then I wanted a teaching credential and a master's degree got that after started that after my son was old enough to go into school and I have student loans that I'm still paying off we have not because of all these hurdles to, to financial security we, we don't we may be in the 20% but we don't have anything to show for that because of all of these different things that we had to do to get us to where we are now. Now we're trying to figure out a payment plan on getting rid of all of the debt that we have and that sort of thing. So right. I, I, on paper, um, but again, like I said, it took student loans and a master's degree right. for me to earn the salary that I make. And it took 30 years for my husband to get to where he is right now. And so we're, we're digging ourselves out from everything we sacrificed and everything that we put on a credit card to make sure that we could get here and live in a decent neighborhood for our kids, like you do. You know, I love it when I drive into a neighborhood and I see an elementary school. I was like, you know, it's like, oh, that's really cool because somebody can walk your kids to elementary school like I did with my kids. 
I mean, it's just, it, you know, there are things about trying to live the American dream that, sh that should be accessible to everyone. It really should be accessible to everyone, and, and it really should matter if you work hard. But you can't tell me that there are minorities that aren't working hard. The stereotype of people being lazy, that's just stop. You know, there are good old white people on welfare. Stop blaming minorities. And, and it's, anyway, okay. Hi, I worked hard. <laughs> <laughs> now I need to. Now I need to. Now I need to pay it all back. Yeah, I was, I was actually curious on that. Now, what 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 your opinion on on free college is? Because as you're saying, even even though you consider yourself income wise to be in the top twenty percent, you I assume have enough of student loans that you can't just right now pay that off. No, you can't, can't just. Pay it in, off. So in a way, because I have absolutely no debt, I've never done anything like that. Even though I make damn near minimum wage, I kind of have more money than you. Yes, that's fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what though. Um, but think about it this way, right? Um, may I ask, what's your level of education? Uh, high school equivalency. Okay, so you got the GED or did it? It's not a GED. But okay. I had to be 18 to do the GED. I took this at 16. I, okay, I perfect. I left high school a year early. Okay, perfect. So, all right, so you, you tested out and you got a yeah. diploma. Okay. Yeah. So, diploma equivalent. Right, okay, yeah. perfect. <laughs> so you could, if you wanted to, you could go to junior college. Based on how well you did in junior college, you could maybe go on to the next level, whatever you want to do. Yeah. You can go to a trade school, you can do those kinds of things. Um, or you can do what you're doing now. Whatever it is, the reality is, is that if you have choices and you have that opportunity that's not going to leave you another 30 years in debt, then you could make those decisions. So one of the things about education, I'd like us to start talking about K through 14 education, not just K through 12. Because for most people, like you said, you make damn near minimum wage, yeah. okay? That means that, and I'm assuming you live here? No, I live in uh, Newport Beach. Okay, so it's, you live in, okay. Yeah, it's clo closer to my work, so I live with my uncle. Okay, great, so you're living with a family member, which means whatever you're contributing to the household or whatever is, is based upon what you can afford to do, and you've worked really hard not to have debt and credit cards and those kinds of things, yeah, so. I mean, I, I'm still paying, still paying a fair amount of rent. He, he doesn't really give me too much of a break. Well, and so, there, and so there you go, right? So <laughs> if you. Rent is most of my paycheck. There it is, <laughs> right? So if you are able to get ahead, if you're able to put any money aside, it's still piece by piece, little by little. Now imagine if you could go to the next level of education because you can have an equivalency, a GED, you can have whatever it is. You could be 18 and breathing and go to junior college in California, as long as they've got room for you. So junior college should be free. Everyone should be able to go to a trade school or junior college and get a certificate or get their first two years of college, it should be free. So we should be talking about K through 14 education. That should be free public school. Then we can have people move on to the next level. I believe that the next level of education should be free as well while you're going. A few years back when I was still working at Boys Republic, I was driving up to Chino Hills and the president of the student body of the UC system had this really incredible plan and it made perfect sense to me and I've got to talk to like economists but I know that Obama picked up on it after he heard this as well. The idea was you go to college for free. If you want to go straight to a four year, you want to go to a two year, you want to go to a two year and transfer, whatever it is, you go for free, right? The system picks up the tab for you, state, whatever. Then you graduate and you get into the career that you want. Not the career you have to have so you can pay the bills, yeah. but the career you want. So if you want to work for a nonprofit for only $25,000 a year, you should be able to work for that nonprofit for $25,000 a year because your job should fulfill you emotionally and not, not, not just financially. You wanna be a doctor, go be a doctor. But if you wanna be a doctor and work at a local clinic, do that too. Because the doctor that opens a private practice, if the practice survives, is going to make a hell of a lot more money than a doctor working at a clinic. But you should be able to work where you want that fulfills whatever passion it is that drove you to the career in the first place. And here's the deal. For 20 years after you graduate, 5% of your income goes back to the university where you graduated. So only 5% of your $25,000 a year or 5% of your $40,000 a year or 5% of your $75,000 a year, or 5% of your $250,000 a year. And then everybody goes to college for free. The That's colleges awesome. and universities will actually make more money. The overhead is gonna be outrageous when you first establish the plan, because you gotta get people through the first four years. 
And so states are going to have to pay a lot of money to make that happen. But the payoff afterwards? Better educated populace. Absolutely. We're not going to hear any of that conversation coming from conservatives. Certainly not the fear-mongering conservatives. Fiscal conservatives, we can have that conversation. Oh, wait a minute. If I have a better educated workforce, I have more economic development, more growth, more people that are making enough money not just to have their house and food on the table, but take vacations, which means they come to my city, so pe more people can go, we and can also visit. also put their money back into the economy. Put their money back into the economy, so you don't have to wait six months to be able to save to afford the new washer and dryer when it goes on the fritz. You, you have that money to do that. You have an opportunity to buy a new car or, or whatever it is that you need to do. And that money all goes back into the economy, but we don't punish people who don't want to make millions of dollars. We don't, we don't punish people who want to be altruistic in the career that they've picked. We don't relegate people like your father to being stuck in a job he didn't want just so he could make sure that his son kept his health care. We don't do that anymore. But the right, the fear-mongering right, we need to keep people uneducated. That's why they don't invest in retraining programs. They just scream about how we have to keep the coal industry going. Seriously? Seriously. Despite the fact that even China's trying to move away from coal. And China, come on, China. You know China? <laughs> Every country in the world except, except for... Nicaragua? Nicaragua. Um, so even Saudi North Ra Korea. Uh, Syria and... yeah. North Korea and Syria are... No, actually... It was Syria and Nicaragua yeah, Syria and, and the Nicaragua. United States. Could, could, I, could I ask you something about sure. that plan, though? Yes. The 5% for 20 mm -hmm. years. Would you say that should be the same for everyone, or should that amount change depending on if you went for... Or, two years versus four years. Um, so you know what, it would make sense to change that based upon whether you did the, whatever level you went to. But if we do, if we do a, a flat rate, then it ends up being beneficial exponentially. So I guess maybe if you only use two years of yeah, public so like university, maybe, five per maybe year. 10, yeah, like five for every year that you go to college, you yeah. pay for, yeah, that makes sense. Like I said, it was an idea that I'm like, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. I have to do more work on it, more research on it, actually talk to economists, people who understand finances better than I do. And I don't want to make ignorant statements based on my lack of experience. But this one, hi, <laughs> this one made sense. I told you. The cat whisperer. The scaredy cat just came up and sat next to me <laughs> and I touched him and he's like, no, no, but still. Okay, sorry, I was very distracted by cuteness. It's fitting that we're talking about politics and his name is Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. Right, DJ. <laughs> Yo, My mom has a weird Thomas Jefferson fetish. You know what? <laughs> I actually went to Washington, D.C. Yeah, I probably got the whole cat thing. I did, I got, a, I got a bump. I got a bump before he jumped on the pool table. Um, I went to Washington, D.C. Uh, a few summers ago, a couple summers ago. Um, I won a travel scholarship from the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum because I was a, a teacher and I did the Holocaust and so I wrote an, an essay about w how I used teach the Holocaust and I was working at Boys Republic so it was really topical to talk to my students about like the ultimate gang leader based upon their own experiences. So I, I won this travel scholarship and going to the Library of Congress was really incredible. Just everything that like, I love about Washington, D.C. Um, is that we paid for it, it's all ours, so you go everywhere and it's free. Um, and it, that's amazing to me, some of the monuments and the museums and these experiences are incredible. But walking into the Library of Congress, they're slowly but surely putting Thomas Jefferson's library back together. And all of his, they're finding his original volumes and they did have placards, like uh, bookmarks in there, mm -hmm. or bind, uh, the spines that were a different color, which meant the original doesn't exist anymore, or this is a copy of the original, but they're, it's like you walk into this, this cool room and it, it's, a, it's all of his bookshelves in a round and you can literally just walk through and it's like, Thomas Jefferson had his hands on his books. He read this. It's, I, that's my favorite part of going to a museum. Always the luminaries. 
Um, we were actually, when we dropped my daughter off at her uh, summer internship, my son and I stopped through Sacramento because he wanted to see the Capitol building and they actually have some exhibits now, which they didn't have when I was there before. And one of them, and they did the California State Library and they have some books. There was a document um, acknowledging California's admittance into the union from Abra it's like the Abraham Lincoln's signature and things. And my favorite thing to do, and I'm, I don't know, I'm an English teacher, isn't that weird, um, is look at books, old books, luminaries. I love going to the Getty and seeing all of those amazing things that survived everything the world has been through. Oh, Sidetrack, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'm curious, actually, speaking of Thomas Jefferson yes. and kind of history in general, what, what is your opinion of the people that want to pretty much try to scratch out anyone from history that ever did anything racist, like owning slaves? Well, I think we just have to, I think if we have honest conversations about the, the darker parts of our history, then we get to, um, we, we can still celebrate and acknowledge the contributions they did make. And we have to think in terms of being a, a product of their time. Yeah. That, that really, we have to keep that perspective. Um, so yeah, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and all of these guys, I mean, the, the Declaration of Independence really meant wealthy white landowners at the time, okay? But, mm -hmm. but there was also room in this constitution for the evolution. So even then, when they wrote these documents, they, they were forward thinking enough to put in processes like amendments that, that enable us to, because they, they didn't want to oppress minorities either. Like, as odd as that sounds, coming from people who were slave owners, they knew the world would evolve. It had always evolved, and so... They were the minority when they first came right. to the colonies. And, 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 and you know, then did a whole lot of murdering and decimating yeah. and whatever to make themselves the majority, but that's what... But comes. also, think about the conversations that we have today. Take health care, for example. Right. In a hundred years, do you think that there are going to be people sitting in a room just like this talking about history where can you believe that they were actually talking about right. this a yeah. hundred years ago yeah. and now we just guarantee health care for exactly. everybody? Exactly, it's or we've or, or we've imploded, and then <laughs> who knows? <laughs> or that. But no, but Canada's that is probably looking down at us thinking that this day. This is true. well, and that <laughs> was one of the funny. But no, when it's we get true. To that it's point. absolutely yeah. Like if if we continue to evolve and move forward, um, we start putting into place some of the protections of education and the environment and those types of things. Then we actually do have a hope that a hundred years from now, three people will be sitting in a room having an intelligent conversation um, about the look how far we've come. And do you think that? You know, Congresswoman Peacock was, uh, you know, had had the had forward thinking ideas, or can you forgive her for those mistakes that she made? I mean, you know, I don't necessarily. Well, maybe I do want to put myself in the category with Jefferson and Washington. Wouldn't that be exciting? <laughs> but still, in my little corner of the world, in my sphere of influence, and and hopefully the sphere gets a little bit larger in 2018. Um, but I, I, you know, we we can't dismiss. We we you know, and I think that's what's wonderful about historians, researchers, people who uncover these things. I mean, what an amazing thing to learn that there's an entire line of Thomas Jefferson's relatives that are black. There's a whole yeah. line. His DNA. I yeah. actually yes. actually have Ancestry.com. Yeah. Um, I have a, I, I got to do my little spit in the thing. I want to see where my people actually come from. Like, where am I from? <laughs> I'm so hoping that I'm not just all white. <laughs> Isn't that silly? It's really silly, but I do. I'm like, I want to shut down my my... If my racist family that believes if it ain't white, it ain't right, and I want to go, look, we're from the Middle East! Well, I mean, trace yeah. it back far enough, we're all from Africa. Right! And basically every human <laughs> has at least, like, a couple points per percentage of Neanderthal DNA. We are stardust. We are the universe. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I was at the Griffith Observatory watching there like... We can get very philosophical. We could, we, we could. Uh, universalists. Yeah, I'd be down with having a second conversation purely philosophical. <laughs> you, I think, are so bright that you might actually make my head spin. Maybe. You might. And I like that about you a lot. I like that about you a lot because I think, um, you know, you have not been afraid in the short time that we've known each other to really point, not, not, not literally point yeah. your finger at me, but really kind of engage in like, okay, but this, and I yeah, like I mean, about I, you. I want to see if I want to vote for you. Because exactly. I, I, when I met you, I knew nothing about nothing you. Nothing about me. Just you were running as Democrat. That's all I knew. Right. 
Well, and that's that happened on another Facebook page um, with a lot of Bernie supporters. Um, you know, a couple of people that know me that have gotten to know me over the course of this new, newly found, like serious political activism that I've gotten involved in, um, were giving me recommendations. But someone else is like, okay, no, I want to hear this, I want to hear this, and I want to hear this because. And I said, okay, here's the deal. Here's 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 me. I don't know, you know, this is me because she was irritated that there were pictures of Hillary and the Obamas, but none of Bernie and their Bernie supporters. So it's like, okay, wait. I went back through all of my photos and all of my posts and I'm like, there are just as many, like I supported Hillary after Bernie lost the primary and I voted for him in the primary because I wasn't going to let Trump be my president. So uh, after the debates, I posted, hey, nice work, you know, that kind of a thing. So it was really, but she made a good point. So I felt, I kind of felt attacked and so I had to go back and defend myself. But she did then make a good point. She goes, hey, I really appreciate you answering this question. And, and, and commenting on this because we can't just take the recommendations of our friends because they say they like you. I need to know more information about you before I can give you my support. And then she said, I'm with you. I'm with Julia. I'm like, oh, very cool. So that matters. It really does matter because if we don't have an informed electorate, then we end up with, I don't know, Donald Trump as president of the United States of America. And I think it's really, it's valuable. It's really valuable to have questions and demand answers. And we're probably not going to agree on everything. And I may leave you disappointed in some of the questions you ask, whether I don't know the answer and I have to go, I, or I, I do know the answer. And you're like, yeah, no, I don't, I don't like I, your take. I, I appreciate the, I don't know more than I do. A the makeup. Stance against I, wanted, me. I wanted to say that earlier. I respect anybody in this world who is able to legitimately look me in the eye and say, I don't know. I well, good, because you were asking about the plan for college. In, and I told you, in theory, it makes perfect sense to me. Now I have to talk to people who understand yeah, numbers we, better we than I do. Like, no, it, it sounds great. I it love does. That. Right. It if really, the math checks out. Yes. If the math checks out, you know, it's kind of like having a conversation about single payer. I did have somebody say, oh, if corporate, everybody, all the businesses that pay for healthcare right now, he did a 50, 25, 25, and it just seemed too simple to me. So I have to ask more questions from other people about whether this works. Now, in my, in my, in my mind, I'm like, oh, yeah, but I don't know if that works on paper. So his idea was if everyone who, all businesses that pay into um, healthcare right now, they take, and, and that leaves people out of it, right? Mm -hmm. So let's not talk about the employees. But all the money that employers pay for insurance now for their employees, you take 50% of that and put it right toward Medicare because it, it would be Medicare for all in single right. payer. 25% of that goes to the employee in the in form of a raise and 25% goes back into the pocket of the corporation. So they just got a 25% raise. Employees just got a 25% raise. Then individuals comes out of their taxes based upon a scale of, you know, like it, whether it's a, like a percent, like everybody pays 8% more in taxes. Well, everybody's still gotten a raise. So now you're paying 8% on a 25% raise. So you're still making money. And, and I was, I'm like, wow. Could it really be that simple? He's a professor of economics, maybe, but I got it. So I, if the, so I don't know if that's the right plan. It sounds great, but we got to really look at some hard numbers. So I have a friend of mine who's actually a physician's assistant, and I asked him, "Here's what I need from you. I need to know how much in America uh, employers spend on insurance premiums every year. I want to know how much employees spend on insurance premiums and copays in every year, and then I want to know, and then I want to, then I want to run the numbers. Let's see if we can do it, and and I can do the research, and I can get people to help me with that information. And if it turns out that that's a good plan." then let's talk about it. Let's have a real conversation about it. So if you can convince a business that you're going to get a 25% raise and you can, can invent, convince employees you're going to get a 25% raise and then everybody's only going to pay like 8 to 10% more in taxes, but you're not paying any of the other out-of-the-pocket stuff anymore. And even if you say, I get 100% coverage from my employer, yeah, but you just got a 25% raise. So if we tax you 8%, you still netted, I can do math, really, 17%. <laughs> you still got a 17% raise. How many people do you know in a year get a 17% raise? <laughs> a really I, good I, union contract. I, 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 <laughs> a really good union contract. 
fact, I was actually thinking. Should have been looking at me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know that many. No, no, right. But but you and I are on the same page, right? Because those are the kinds of phrases that I that my union negotiates with our administrators based upon we just got a a 14.91% raise uh, a year and a half ago, two, maybe two years ago. Um, we added 25 minutes to our school day and stretch it to seven periods. And, and I don't like it, but I did get a really good raise. And so I'm having to do more with less time with the kids. And so that's really a struggle. And I, I admit that, mm -hmm. but I also needed the, the money. So I've made my own bed and I'm lying in it now. So if I complain about the fact that we have seven periods a day, I have no one to blame but myself and I everyone else has voted for it. Well, no, it's tough. It yeah. really is tough. So we have to, you have to be a really good educator and be very engaging to do a lot with the limited time that we have. So this is why I didn't do my homework. Right? <laughs> well, I, my only homework in my classroom is 30 minutes of reading a night, four nights a week. Yeah, but if all seven periods make you do that, it's three and a half hours every night. Plus... No, plus well, half an hour of reading. You just read the same book for every class. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just kidding. saying. Well, no, mo most right. classes try to give you an hour of homework. And, and for an average... Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll ding off PE, so five periods. <laughs> right. Because the well, standard school has six, six periods. Yeah. Mine's seven yeah, but, now. Yeah, so standard is six, ding off... Uh, yeah, you're right. Ding off one. That's, that's five hours of homework on top of the seven hours you're already at school. I know. Who the hell works 12 hours a day? Who the hell works kids 12 hours a day? You're right. That's why I only do reading. Sorry, now I'm yelling. No, that's okay. I, no, right, yeah. That's it's it's passion. That right, is. it is passion. See, it's passion. Oh. Hatred of the education system is something. It's, it's well, tough. It's like, tough. I, I always point back to uh, my math and science classes when I was in school. I had very advanced test scores. I was progressed along science, and they held me back on math because I didn't do my homework. And I, I did the math in my head when they handed me my syllabus my freshman year. Homework is worth 10%, so I asked the teacher. So if I don't do my homework, I can still get an A if I get 90% everything else, mm -hmm. right? And he laughed at me and said you would have to ace everything and you but did. yes technically you can get an a if did you, you don't ace do everything <laughs> i aced everything i didn't do one drop of homework that entire year and so you got an a minus right nice work <laughs> knuckles but, sorry you can't but, see that on a podcast <laughs> knuckles but they but, but they we have we have video we're taking we, video we we, we we have video and <laughs> <laughs> are you getting my best side <laughs> Sorry, we didn't specify that. Uh, no, know. I saw it originally, but I but, uh, I would have been. I'm glad you turned the screen down yeah. because I would have been distracted. I'm like, yeah. oh hi, yeah. <laughs> Juliet. Yeah. That's why we did that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you'll you'll get the video Perfect. later, and no, I'm all nervous. We, now we, I'm like, oh. we can look we can look at it later and see that. see if we like it. Okay. Or no we worries. Just pull the audio out. Out before we started. Nice. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a friend of mine speaking about the traditional education system. Um, he is now highly qualified to teach. Social studies, English, I think at least through Algebra 2 in math, and he has a special ed credential, and he works at a high school in Corona, and did none of the work in any of his AP classes, and then managed to convince his teachers who were giving him Fs to change the grade when the AP scores came back, and he got fives on every one of his AP exams. So that you're right, there's a problem with traditional school, and I think that's, I'm hopeful that we will get away from it and back to what I remember when I was in high school where the kids had to take their English and their math and their science and social studies but then at lunch or whatever the end of the day was there were internship programs and apprenticeship programs and hands-on programs not just on campus but I, I knew a guy that every day after lunch he would go and work um, at a mechanic with an auto mechanic and then eventually when I ran into him years later after high school, that's what he was doing. So he got that hands-on work experience. And even my school district, we have a correct, uh, director of curriculum and instruction who is really, really pushing for embedding certificate programs into high school so that we get that kids awesome. who are career ready by the time they graduate or are ready to go into the next level in a trade school or junior college or for those kids that do want to be four-year university bound they can go there as well and then we're not leaving kids behind and in the community where i teach you are more likely to find a low-paying fast food job than you are 
able to find any kind of industry or business or tech or anything. Um, and so we're, we continue, if we don't do something better in a school district like mine and school districts all over the place, I mean, even wealthy schools still need to provide these programs for right. students that aren't going to be traditionally college bound students because you, you cannot measure success by how many people are book smart. You have to take a look at some of the innovators and some of the, the changes that have happened in development and technology and all of these different things. And even the arts, let's stop relegating people to office jobs and, and get back to the creative arts and allowing kids to be painters and musicians and these kinds of things that we just decimated all of these programs with no child left behind. So my hope is that with, especially in California with that local control funding formula, we can actually take a look at some of the career and technical education programs that we can put in place and bring back to our school, get auto body and small engine repair back so that the kids that don't want to sit in, a, in an academic class all day can be required to get the minimum grade necessary to have those programs the rest of their day. I think it's, it's valuable. You know, it's, it's something I used to tell the boys at Boys Republic. It's like, look, I have a master's degree. I'm a public school teacher. This is what I wanted to do. And that's why I paid all the money to get the education because that's what I wanted. I said, but if you guys are better with your hands, let's take a look at this. Uh, electricians and plumbers. I said, for those of us that are really book smart, that are really good at learning, um, I'm not gonna fix my own plumbing because after a certain change the faucet, fix the toilet, I'm done. I, I don't have a snake to get, you know, whatever weird thing my toddler dumped in the toilet out. You know, there are different things that I just can't do. I can't find leaks under the ground, those kinds of things. Electricians, I don't mess with electricity because I, zzz, I shocked myself when I was eight and a half months pregnant. I think that's why my daughter is such, so brilliant is because she's my Frankenstein baby. I had to go into the hospital because I was changing the, the outlet cover and the outlet and I didn't turn anything off. And so zzz, and I'm like, you know, so I had to go into the hospital, put the fetal like monitor. No, no, <laughs> stupid. Hi, stupid. Hi, see? No electricity for Julia. None. So I used to tell my students, I said, look, Says I'll tell you. teacher with a master's degree. <laughs> American <laughs> literature and culture and a master's in education. I know my limits. Didn't this you just say you respect now. Right? Didn't you just say you respect a person that says they don't know? <laughs> How about a person that learns the hard way? <laughs> So, I would tell my students, there are things that you can learn that other people don't want to do. Mm -hmm. When I come home and it's dark, I want to flip the switch and have the lights come on and I can't do that for myself, apart from maybe changing a breaker. And even now, oh, it's all high tech, I don't get it. And plumbing, I said, when I go, I want it to disappear. And if it doesn't, I'm going to hire somebody to come do that for me. And so I, I found a, a program for my students, another NPR story. My favorite thing to do is listen to NPR. NPR is great. It is great. It is great. And if you go to allsides.com, um, it shows you left and right bias for articles and mm -hmm. reports and stuff. NPR in, is always in the middle. I've, I've taken a look at them after it's, yeah. I, I saw you put it up on Facebook. Okay, yeah, it's really, and so I like to make sure, and so I listen to them because I know that it's news. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I heard a program, six weeks, $2,500 program, to train people to fix the engines on the wind turbines. Your challenge is you can't be afraid of heights. Mm -hmm. But the starting pay was $30 an hour. Wow. Right? So scrape together, figure out how we can get kids that $2,500 for that program, and then they start making $30 an hour, and you don't have six weeks of training? Are you kidding me? So it's possible. Machinists, where have all the machinists gone? Because there's a company that does uh, the engines for rockets, and jets and things in Los Angeles. The last I heard was like five years ago. They're 200 employees down because nobody's being trained to be a machinist anymore. My father-in-law did that for a living. He was a machinist. And we don't, we don't, so that was another, there, I found out there was a school. So one of my students who'd been heavy into gangs he was a single parent by the time he was 16 years old, had another baby on the way. I remember him sending me calling me back. Ms. Peacock, thank you so much. I got into that program 
and I'm now making really good money and I can help support my kids. Right? Not everybody has to be a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer. We just have to find, we have to give people an opportunity to find what makes them happy. What are they passionate about? Is it working with your hands? Is it creating something that doesn't exist? I had a conversation last night with somebody who said, well, automation is going to do this and do this and do this, and it's going to put people out of work. You know, some people will lose their jobs. I was just listening again to NPR this, this afternoon on my way here about um, automatic cars, right? Mm -hmm. Driverless cars. That's going to change everything. But Uber changed the taxi industry and cars change the horse and buggy industry. And yeah, people lose jobs, but that's where we get back into education. So how do we then retrain people? So if you can't drive the car anymore, how do we retrain you to be someone who programs the cars or fixes the cars? There's overhead logistics for Yeah, for all managing the, the that, managing now. that. They predict within 10 years they're going to see an 80% decrease in car ownership in the United States. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do with all the auto workers? They're, going to, they're still going to be building automated cars. They're just going to have right. a whole level of programmers. And cars are computerized now. There's still going to be a massive mechanical end to Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And it's only going to get more complicated. Yeah. And look at what has happened to the auto repair industry. They've had to become more innovative. Right? When I go to get my car dealt with, they computer tech check it. But then a person fixes it. Right. A number of people fix it. I just, just driving through Valvoline to get my oil changed. There's three different people working on that car because the oil doesn't change itself. Mm -hmm. Yet. Yet. <laughs> I mean, hey, they're driving yeah. themselves now. Right. So anyway, I hate to do this. What time is it? Where are we? It is 12:45. Fantastic. So what else do you guys have for me? Um, as a teacher and a union member, mm -hmm. um, you've been very involved with tight-knit communities and getting people propelled forward. Mm -hmm. um, is there more via legislation that you could see done to help that end? Um, I believe we need to end right to work. I think that needs to be eliminated because that's a lie. Um, for example, I used to work at uh, Boys Republic and there was a teacher who refused to pay union dues because he, he was right to work, he doesn't have to. Mm -hmm. Well, so he got the contract benefit, that's fine. But when it came time to file um, for discrimination at work, he had no protection. So he was sold a lie. Why should I pay for union dues? Well, when it came time for you to be discriminated against, the union did not have to protect you. And that's a problem. So right to work is, it just says, hey, We'll keep unions out of it and take care of you. You don't have to pay for any of those protections. And then employers can run rampant over employees. Um, the employee free choice, that's huge. That's huge. We need to make it illegal for companies to discriminate against people who want to form unions. Because we've given corporations way too much power. And that's some legislation that needs to be put into place. And it keeps coming up, keeps coming up, keeps coming up. It's on the books. Nobody's doing anything about it. And I think we really have to start talking again about those things we were mentioning earlier. Economic disparity, economic inequality, and the decline in unions. And they're, they're, they're separate at a very close pace. Mm -hmm. And unions should not be the enemy. I mean, and, and if we want to well corrupt unions and Jimmy Hoffa and blah, blah, come on now. And we have that everywhere. We have corporations, companies like Patagonia, that takes care of their employees. But that <clears throat> altruism doesn't exist across the board. So if we legislate only based upon, well, we, can't, we don't need that because we've got good small business owners and we have good this and good that. Great. We yeah, also have so. the ones that are horrible. And, and child labor laws not b exist. Why? Because they were exploiting children. So we have environmental laws and protections. Why? Because they were polluting the environment and hurting people. So those yeah, that's two... That's why Flint still doesn't have clean drinking water. And, oh... Hmm... Because the government was allowed to circumvent... Hmm... 
Okay, yes, right? We have people in the United States of America who don't have clean drinking water. And we're not just talking about that kind of tragedy that happens in Flint that everybody ignores and now everybody's being prosecuted for. We're talking about just normal, everyday people that have never had access to clean drinking water. We have 800 million, 800 million people on the planet that don't have access to clean drinking water. Those types of protections, the Streams Act thing that they got rid of, Mm-hmm. That our congressman, not yours, ours, but still. Well, no, I'm, I'm Tech, legally, I'm registered to vote here, so it is mine. All right. <laughs> our congressman thought was a great idea. Coal companies can now pollute our streams mm-hmm. and, our, and our rivers and our, and our, what? Wait a minute, what? There's only 3% of the Earth's, pop, Earth's water supply is actually potable. It may be less than that now. And you're going to let coal companies in the United States for what? So that the coal companies can pat you on the back, pat you on the back, and give you more money? How many coal companies do we have here in the 42nd congressional district? So what could it be besides money? Mm-hmm. And and that's that, that has to stop. Yeah, that dark money in politics. It's got to go. Citizens United. There's some really serious things that take away the voice of the individual human being to determine what's good for them and their families, even if they disagree with me. But we have to stop that kind of corporate raid on our democracy. It's appalling. I, there are Democrats that I'm furious with. I thought Cory Booker was going to be a voice, like maybe 2020, right? And then it turned out he voted against allowing the pharmaceutical companies in Canada to ship to the United States without the tariffs and the extra charges, and he voted against it. Turns out he took $25,000 $25, from Big Pharma. I don't want their money. I don't want it. I will not be beholden to people who put, or companies, who put people over Oh, profits. but corporations are people. Uh-huh. And money is speech. Too. Right. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's, it's appalling. And that's one of the biggest questions that I'm getting from people who want to endorse me, whether it's a group or a, an individual. Are you going to take corporate money? No. Somebody asked me, um, you gonna, uh, what about lobbyists? Because if, if, when I'm elected, the Democrats will expect me to raise money for the Democratic Party. So that he said, are you going to talk to lobbyists? I said, it depends on the lobbyist. NRA? No. I don't have anything to say. Nothing to say to the NRA. When you, when you refuse to do anything after 20 kindergartner, kindergarten and first grade children are mowed down and six adults die trying to protect them because of a semi-automatic weapon, don't you dare come knocking on my door. Got nothing to say to the NRA because that's not gun, that's not gun sense. That's murder and I don't wanna have a conversation. But are you a lobbyist for early childhood education? Are you a lobbyist for women's reproductive rights? Let's have a conversation. These things that I believe in because there are organizations out there who have representatives who are trying to protect women and children and minorities and they need to be allowed in the room. As long as their motives are not based on personal corporate greed, then we have to have honest conversations and allow those people in the room. Because I don't have all the answers. I don't, I don't know every single detail of, of kids in preschool, but I do know from personal experience that both of my kids went to preschool and they are doing exceptionally well in school. Part of that was I had to go back to work. So my daughter had, was almost three and my son was about three and a half and I had to go back to work. We couldn't afford to live. That's that debt we're still trying to get out of. Mm-hmm. Even all these years later, 20 some odd years, well, my son's 14. So 14 years later, we're still pulling ourselves out of the debt that we cho- chose to get into to make sure that I could stay home with the kids for the first three years. The student loans that we took out, we're getting out of that debt. Why? Because it, it mattered more that I get my education and get moving forward because I wanted, I wanted more for me, for my family. Um, it's also been a great way to tell my daughter, uh, please don't wait like I did. Don't have a family, don't have kids, and then try to go back to school because just go. So she's living the college dream that my husband and I never, never had. Dorm, apartment, friends, summer internships. It was very difficult to drop her off at her gig for the summer Why? because she didn't come home. She chose not to come home, and I, I miss her terribly. But I do her a disservice if I use my emotions to hold her back from living the life 
that we helped her get to. Like, that's what we wanted. And I want her to go save the planet, and I want her to make friends, and I want her to experience new things. I, I don't, she doesn't want to move back to Southern California. Good, go live in the Bay Area. I love visiting the Bay Area. I can't afford to live there, but I love visiting. Whatever it is that she wants, I have to encourage her to be happy. So there are, there are people who know more about important things to me, you know, economists that have to be talked to about how to really put together a good bill that makes economic sense, fiscal sense, because you get more people to buy into a program. Like I said, if you can save small businesses money over the, with their health insurance overhead and put that money back into really honestly building the business, hiring more workers, those kinds of things, then, then everybody wins. Even if that's not a conservative idea, it ends up having conservative benefits. I don't think that we should put our country into such great debt with these programs, but I think that if we invest in these programs and then the economy picks up from there, and if we put middle America back to work in new jobs, we've got to invest in the educational programs to retrain somebody who's only known the coal mine or has only known the steel industry and all of them have closed. We need to, we need to stop allowing, like businesses, you don't want to pay your 20% tax. My husband and I pay 28. Why shouldn't you pay your fair share, right? Why? So you send the, the company to a country where you can pay people a dollar a day to work? Come on. It's too expensive to do business. It just depends on what too expensive. Now, if you're really losing money as a business, that would make sense to me. But if you're just talking about your profit margin has gone down, your CEO paycheck has gone down, that's that income inequality we're talking about. All the people doing the work for you so you guys can continue to get rich and keep it all for yourselves. And that's what happens when businesses are allowed to take. Now, that doesn't mean manufacturing is going to come back the same way manufacturing has been, was back in the 1960s and 70s because automation has changed some things. Right. But there are new things we don't even know about yet. New industries that we don't know about yet. So going back to public education, I, I don't... Vouchers, no. So I will do everything in my power, whether I have to do it with bills and legislation or just with no votes, to make sure Betsy DeVos does not destroy our public education system, period. There's too much we have fought for, too far we have come. I am go not going to go back on marriage equality. I'm not going back. I got ordained so that I could perform the wedding ceremony for my friend Debbie and her wife Sherry. I'm not even a religious person, but it mattered to me for them that, I, that they were allowed to have the lives that they have now. Sherry writes legislation to protect children in Arkansas and Debbie is an attorney and they adopted three little boys. Not so little now, but they were, I believe, eight, seven, and six. They adopted these three brothers. Hmm. If, if, if I'm not open to marriage equality, what happens to those three boys? What happens if those two women don't build a family and take all three of those kids? Then those three little boys get shipped off to who knows where. Now they get to stay together and be brothers in their forever family. Marriage equality allowed for that because they weren't gonna let, they don't let single women. And kudos to Arkansas for even allowing a lesbian couple to do it. But that's, those are the kinds of things we can't go back on. So I will do everything in my power to stop any legislation that comes through that takes back these civil and human rights that people deserve. I want to stop. There are three states still in the United States of America that once you have a felony, you don't ever get your voting rights back. That needs to stop. If we talk about people being incarcerated and paying their dues to society, why do you deny them their right to vote? They can't even have an opinion on the type of legislators. <laughs> the governor in Florida, three white person panel telling human being after human being after human being, regardless of what their felony was, yeah, thanks for your application to restore your voting rights, but they, they're being denied. Good luck to you. Wow. Yeah. 
There are still three states in the United States of America. Do you know which one? I know it's Florida. I think the other one... I'm, no, I don't. Okay. I'm not going to say... Out. No, there are two more, and I, I was watching Samantha Bee, who I love. Um, I was, it was, she, was, she did the news report, and I, I actually, despite the fact that I listen to NPR all the time and I do watch MSNBC, I do love watching uh, Samantha Bee because it's... it's and the Daily Show because I really like my politics with a little bit of comedy because if you can't cr laugh you're gonna have to weep a lot or get angry and I'm tired of being angry. I just want to I just want to be active now. I was angry but I'm not angry anymore and I don't cry anymore and I don't I don't you know throw things over his tweets and all that kind of stuff. Now I'm like okay I've got some more I've got some more ammunition when it comes to running a good campaign that can be the antithesis of what's going on in Washington right now on the on the uh, Republican Congress. Now you Good. just calm down with a hot cup of coffee, babe. Coffee, <laughs> Yes. Oh my gosh. Oh. It's still a running joke in this household. It is still funny. I see people on Twitter have changed their handles. They've yeah. changed their names on Twitter. Richard Coffee, babe. I it, it and I couldn't help it. I am sarcasm is my second language. That's why I have to learn Spanish now. <laughs> I'm, I'm do, doing du, Duolingo to try to learn Spanish, and I'm, I'm really, I've got to, I've got to focus, anyway. But sorry, I just went nuts with that coffee thing. I, that's like, oh, you're a, pop, you're a candidate, you shouldn't do that. No, I, st I still get to be human. Yeah, no, I really still have see, to be human no. and have, have some, I, I have to be entertained. The only thing that I thought was ridiculous about that whole thing was when they started trying to turn it into an actual news story. <laughs> and then I, I was shaking my head over it. I was like, <laughs> why can't we just use it as the sound bite before we go out and say, and any, another act of coffee? Any, any intelligent well, person who read it, yeah. any intelligent Which person who read it knew what it was supposed to be, and he tweeted it out midnight Eastern time, so he fell asleep tweeting and accidentally hit send. <laughs> Which is funny enough in it itself. Is, it is. That's why I knew it. I knew what he was trying to say, but it was just so much it was just fun. A, it was just an incomplete tweet. I think one of the funniest tweets I saw was somebody likening it to Elvis dying on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> no disrespect wow. to the king, but yeah, I just, I just enjoyed every bit of it, and all the alt and the rogue uh, government stuff that the, you know that they're out there tweeting, and I just. You know, it always makes me sad every time I see another one of those posts from like I think all, it was Alt Immigration. He's like, I'm leaving and I'm not going to be here. Or she, whoever it's been tweeting under that moniker, mm -hmm. uh, under that handle, is going to be gone now. But it's been fun. It's been really fun. I, I still have, like I said, I got to laugh. I have to laugh. Yeah, and, something you mentioned, people saying that you shouldn't be making jokes about that because you're running for something. I, I, I really hate that mentality. You're running for House of representatives. Right. You should be hold representing on, on. the people. Donald Trump is the president of the United States. That aside. <laughs> right? That aside. Well, you know, I think I think part of the and this has actually been one of the biggest challenges and that was I was talking about all the advice that I'm getting. Um, it, it's a very it's a very delicate balance that I do have to run because I am going to be representing any everyone. Mm -hmm. um, that's over 700,000 people and that's whether you vote or not, whether you're documented or not, that's the number of people that live in this district. And so I've got a lot of people with a lot of experience um, who have an idea of what a candidate should look like. And of course, I wouldn't be a candidate if it hadn't been for November 2016. I'd still be, you know, I already had it, I had it mapped out. I was going to be a high school teacher till I was 61 and a half and I could take my full retirement. And then I was going to convince my husband to move up to, well, he didn't have to convince him, but he's not that much older than me, so he has to, we have to wait till he's retirement age. But I was going to convince him that he could work out of our Tahoe office <laughs> and, and we could go live in Tahoe and, you know, live in a ski town with a great summer life and, you know, have some good food and, and be, live, you know, and I'm not, I was just going to be fine with that. Um, November changed everything. You know, this, the, the plan had to change. Not because, um, not because I have these personal aspirations of making all of this money because this is just gonna, this, the, the toll that it's already taking to be a candidate on my family and the time on the, my son is 14 years old, he's gonna start high school in September and that means when I'm elected in November, by December, I'm going to be living in Washington DC for more than half of the time. And I still have my son and my husband 100% supportive, but 
you know, we're all now under scrutiny. And I, I have completely put my personal life on public display. And so people have made horrible derogatory, com derogatory comments about me, if they don't even know me. They've made suggest you know, I get all sorts of stuff and all sorts of suggestion, but there's someone that I've become friends with over the course of this whole transition into activist. And she goes, she said, you know what? When you laugh, when you cry, she goes, if you're doing it because you're human, that's gonna resonate with people. She goes, you cannot change who you are. And so sometimes I'm gonna be sarcastic and I'm gonna say the wrong thing. We had that conversation. Sometimes I'm gonna yell at people I disagree with because I get that passionate that quickly. And so I'm gonna to have to temper some of that, but yeah, I can't no, no, change I, who I am. Well, what was it? I eventually ended up changing my mind on that because as you guys both said, he was right. You guys, were, you were right. He addressed the audience first. Right. And you were part of the audience. Right. That's just answering answer well, that. Yeah, it's, and so, you know, but there, there, I'm gonna have some really strong disagreements. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be <clears throat> put, called on the table for things and I'm gonna to have to give explanations and not everybody's gonna be okay with, I don't know. You know, I always believe right. that you don't, you don't lie to people. You don't make things up for people. You answer honestly. And if I don't know, then I have to tell you I don't know. But I will look into that because I need to give you an answer if I'm going to be your representative. But not everybody's going to be okay with that. They're Can going to I, expect me to have all the answers yeah. right now. Can I say something on that? Sure. As I was trying to say earlier, uh, somebody, who's, somebody who's being a representative, anyone, anyone in Congress or, or a state legislator, the, the idea is they are supposed to be representing this amount of people. They shouldn't just already have their hardline ideas right. that they believe in and stick to those no matter what the people they're representing say. This is supposed to be the point of town halls. You're supposed to be right. getting a feel for what your your people think right. and p potentially change your mind based on what they're saying. If you don't know, take their opinions in consideration. Exactly. And well, hell, if you see a massive swing in one direction, like 80% of people feel one way, but you believe what the 20% believe, you really should be principled enough to vote with the 80 because that's what your district wants and your representative Well, and that's and district. I think that's what's really important is like not this conversation that keeps coming out about the these two different health care plans, one from the house and one from the senate. I, my opponent is absolutely adamant that this is like the best thing since sliced bread and that is so insulting because his constituents don't believe that. Now the people who are giving him big, big checks, they believe that. Hey, great. Great. Ah, uh, we don't have to pay for health care anymore. Why should we put our hard-earned money into paying for people who are too lazy to work or da-da-da? Huh? Um, you realize that a healthy workforce means more productivity for your business, more money back in the economy? What's wrong with you? Also, also, what I really don't understand, they're actually, even the, or, even the corporations are arguing against their own interests, because currently a lot of them probably have to pay for the health insurance of their employees. If everything was just taken out of people's taxes, just... The owners would have to pay their individual fair share of it, right? And all their it, it employees. Just, it's all. Like, it's all silly, <laughs> but yeah. So you know what? If you know, I've got to. Everyone's wrong. Everyone can win. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I don't know what the needs of the African American community in this district are, but I'm going to. I already have a a, a meeting with the NAACP um, for our area on Saturday morning. And I've been in contact with the president of the NAACP, um, and and we're going to have conversations because I need to know how do I represent the African American community if I don't know what they need, and they've been ignored in our district, and they're not they're, they're, there's not like we have to have these conversations because maybe community policing is a really big issue to them. Okay, so I need to know I need to know what their issues are. What about the Asian community? We have a 36 percent of the population of Eastvale. I need to have conversations. What are your needs? What's, what's going on, right? And, and what about the immigrant population? What about the Hispanic population? What about these underserved and under, underrepresented minorities? And I'll tell you what, I was just having a conversation with the gal that's in charge of our, she's been working for my homeowners association at our clubhouse for years. She's like the community director for our, for our association. And uh, I, I saw her yesterday, or maybe Wednesday, and I said, you know for how many years you've been working in our community, how much it's changed. When I moved into my neighborhood 13 years ago, it was pretty white. Doesn't look like that anymore. Even my own small community has become more diverse. That means we have to have more conversations because it's not just as simple as what's good for this group or what's good for that group. And then balance all of that 
with how it works best for the entire community. And I'm not lost on the daunting challenge that that's going to be. And I'm not lost on the fact that people are gonna go, you don't have enough experience to be able to do that. But at least I'm opening the door to the conversation. Our, right. our representative has never done that. I had a conversation with um, a gentleman named Hector, who is a member of the NAACP here. And he remembers, uh, it was a homeless shelter, soup kitchen, some kind of community event. And Calvert was standing next to him during the entire event. They're both serving their food. Calvert says not one word to him. He's a brown man. Not one word. And then he relates to me. All of a sudden, he feels this arm reach around him, grab him, stop. He looks up. Calvert's staff is taking pictures. The pictures are over. The arm goes down. He goes back and never says a word to the man. Our community of color is not a photo opportunity. They're human beings. That's horrible. That's horrible. That's the representation wow. that we have in this community. None. None. If you aren't wealthy and you aren't white, you don't get a seat at the table. And I keep listening to people, well, he's always been open to me. Did you vote for him? Did you tell <laughs> his staff that you were a Republican? Because of course he opens the door for you. Of course he does. But I've been to his office at least three times now. His staff won't even tell us when he's going to be in town and what his schedule looks like. And you know what he hides behind? This NRA supporting guy hides behind? The danger of being a representative. Because look what happened to Gabby Giffords. Okay, but when Scalise was shot at a baseball practice, y'all got outraged. An attack on one of us is an attack on all of us, unless they're innocent school children, unless it's a democratic congresswoman. Huh, you hypocrites. So he's hiding behind, well, Capitol Police have told us, uh, Capitol Police showed up at the baseball game. If you're that afraid, get yourself a bodyguard. But not seeing human beings in our community because he's afraid for his safety, Seriously? Shouldn't that, shouldn't that say enough there? He, he, he's afraid of the people he represents? Yeah, that's my <laughs> point. What are you so afraid of? My son is in more danger going to public school based upon attacks at schools. I have to worry about the children I teach. I have active shooter drills at my school once every three months, and I have to have honest conversations about how we can barricade the door and which window will be safer when I get them the hell out? That's more of a concern for me. Well, I mean, really, really, no matter how the rate of, of school shootings was, I mean, safety is always important. You probably should be doing that anyway, even no, if it was. We weren't having that conversation thing. before Columbine. We never had active shooter drills when I was a kid. We, we had tornado drills, grew up in Ohio. In California, we had earthquake drills, active shooter. And our congressman, who we elected, we pay his salary. He doesn't want to come out because he's afraid he's going to get shot. How dare you? Our kids go to school every single day. I go teach in a public school every single day. How about the people that are being shot at mosques? For being their religion. For going to pray. How about, how about Aurora and the movie theater? And Americans are still getting up. They're going to work. They're going to school. They're sending their kids to the movies. They're going to amusement parks. They're going to church. They're worshiping. They're doing all of these things. And you, who were elected to represent us and spend time with us and know what the needs of your community, you're too afraid? Mm -mm. No. No. I, I just, I don't buy it. And that's not, that's not fair to the constituents at all. So, here I am. I mean, seriously, I've met you guys a couple of times. I've seen some great posts that you've, you've defended unions and healthcare and those types of things on Facebook. But you know what I did today? I got up and I came to your house. No idea what to expect, trusting that what you represented was actually what was gonna happen, and I did it. I did it. Why? Because it matters to me. If you want to talk to me about who I am and what I represent and how I will represent you, then I need to sit down with you and have that conversation. 
I can't be afraid. I can't even be afraid of, well, somebody said, you know, town halls, you're going to get the Trump supporters out there. Okay, great. Okay. You should be angling for having everybody out there. Yeah. Yeah, it should be it, a, it shouldn't a place be, of open no, it should No, it shouldn't just be a friendly audience. I don't need psych fans. I don't need people who nod their head and say yes to everything I have to say. How ignorant of me to expect. And I don't. That's why I don't. You know, I learned something. One of the greatest things about teaching is I learn something from my students every day. I learn just as much as I teach. I, that's why I... I didn't just settle for a teaching credential and a bachelor's degree. I got my master's degree. I still want a PhD someday. I don't know when that's going to happen. I got my own kids to get through school first before I start thinking about furthering my education. But I, when, when I decide that I know everything or I surround myself, that this is what's going on in Washington right now. This administration is surrounding themsel himself with people you saw. The, the, I'm so blessed to be part of your cabinet. <laughs> Dictators do that. Yep. Not democratic leaders. Not not in a democracy. So I can't have people around me who tell me yes all the time. I have to have people around who question what I represent. And if I don't know the answer, I better go find it. Because if it's a need of someone in this community, then I better have a way to help. It matters. It matters to stay open and have conversations. And it's not always gonna go well. I'm going to stick my foot in my mouth sometimes. I'm going to yell sometimes. I might even cry. <laughs> but I'm still gonna be human and I'm still gonna be open. And transparency is a huge part of, of making sure that this is right. Win or lose, it will not be because I hid. It will not be because I didn't listen to people. That I didn't make myself available. And if, and if people are still stuck on the status quo and think that Calvert hiding and avoiding them is really the way they want to go, there's not a whole lot I can do to change that, except continue to push forward and be me. We good? Yeah, I think that's an excellent note to end on. Fantastic. I still have one question. Okay. We can, oh, no, do it. Say, it's, it. It's kind of indirectly come up a few times during all of this. I, I was curious what your stance exactly on gun control is. Because a lot of Republicans think that the Democrat position is just total gun ban, right. but there's a hell of a lot more nuance between the two extremes. Yeah, there are. Um, you know, I personally had an experience when I was, I was 19 and I had a roommate who was older than me and he had guns and I was living in an apartment. I just put an ad in the paper, like I need a roommate, that kind of thing. He was a really nice guy um, until it got weird. But anyway, that's a totally different story. But he had some friends with guns. And so we went up to um, Fraser Park and we had some rifles and we had some handguns. And it turns out I'm a really good shot. Now mind you, I'm, I'm young, I'm still 19 years old. Um, and my, I grew up in a family where guns was, my dad had a shotgun. You know, I remember when our, our duplex was broken into when I was in kindergarten and my dad and the dog went through the house to make sure nobody was there. Um, and my dad had his, had his shotgun, he had a rifle. Um, and that was it. And it, I, don't, you know, I don't know if he kept it loaded or not, but it was not something that my brother and, and, and I were ever allowed to mess with and I didn't care to. So 19 years old and we go up into the mountains and we're shooting guns and I'm, I'm a really good shot. And, and then uh, they put a, a handgun, I had a pistol in my hand. And they put a can in, in some bushes. And I was making that can just bounce, 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 bounce. It was really, I wouldn't be now. My eyes are really bad now. But anyway, at one point, the can fell out of the bush. And so they had me hold the gun down at my side, put the safety on, get my finger off the trigger, all the right things you're supposed to do. And then a human being walked in front of me and picked up the can and was putting it back in the bush. And, and time just completely slowed down. And I realized that despite the safety, despite my finger off the trigger, that in my hand, I held something that could have taken his life in less than a second. And I was so bothered by that feeling of power through violence that I took the gun and literally like, like it was a dirty napkin. And I said, I'm, I'm done, you need to take this. And I've never held a gun since because it was too overwhelming, that power that I had to end a human being's life. 
And so, I don't, I don't believe we need um, semi-automatic weapons. I don't, I, I don't understand people having an arsenal. I don't understand not making sure the severely mentally ill can't get a hold of guns. I don't understand not continuing the Brady Bill. I, I don't, I don't understand the uh, lifting the assault ban. I don't understand any of that. I don't understand any of that because uh, children are more likely to die in a home from a gun with a gun in a home. Um, I, I, people are more likely to die with a gun in their home. I still argue that the Second Amendment was written when we had muskets and it took you a really long time to load it. And, and so I, 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 I don't understand why that hasn't evolved. You know, we have these amendments where we ended slavery. We have an amendment that gave women the right to vote. We have um, amendments that keep our president from serving more than two consecutive terms. Why not re responsible gun laws? And, and so I don't have all the answers and I know I will make enemies based upon some of the answers that I've given. I really don't think we have to take everybody's guns away but I really want to know what it is that makes people want to have that many. I was visiting my family one of the last times I've been to Ohio, and it was our last night there, and I was staying with my aunt and uncle. And their dog was in their bedroom, and the door was shut, and my son was probably eight or nine, and he wanted to go see the dog. And they couldn't let him in the room because they had all their guns were in their bedroom because they had outgrown their gun case. That. Wow. that kept at least 20 guns. They both kept a gun in their nightstand. They kept guns everywhere. But I also know that, I mean, to what end? You have to break gun safety rules, even if they're not laws, to really protect yourself in self-defense with a gun in the home, which means you've got to keep a loaded gun somewhere near you, mm -hmm. which ri runs the risk exponentially of having an accident with a gun. The story years ago about the young man who surprised his father came home from college and his dad thought he was a burglar and shot his own son dead in the house. Whoa. The six-year-old in Flint, Michigan years ago who found his dad's gun and shot his classmate playing with it in the classroom. How many more I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, it is such a, it doesn't make sense to me. It really doesn't, like fundamentally doesn't make sense to me that people have to have gun after gun after gun and, and guns that shoot really, really fast. I mean, I think of what happened to those police officers in Dallas during the Black Lives Matter march and how many gun owners they had to chase to make sure it wasn't that person. Like, because you can open carry. Well then who's the bad guy? Who's the bad guy then? Mm -hmm. Right? If you can open carry and somebody starts shooting at people, who's the bad guy? And how much faster can you actually get to the bad guy or bad woman, whatever, if not everybody has the gun? I just, maybe I'm naive, that's fine. Maybe I'm just ignorant. Maybe I just don't understand. May I, okay, I'll, I'll there, continue. There's a cultural difference surrounding it. Um, if you look at other countries where it's a lot different than it is here, Switzerland. Everybody in Switzerland has a fully automatic rifle in their home. Really? Every adult in Switzerland has a fully automatic rifle. Every adult in Switzerland is conscripted into their military. They are trained. They are, no, they are trained to respect that weapon, know what it's for. Every single adult there knows how to properly store it and maintain it and know I guess to, their crime is a lot less their than cra ours. Their crime is probably as close to zero as they come. 
but the culture there is completely different no, from here. Was, was, is it Norway? Norway is another country that they have their police training is mm -hmm. two years or 18 months. You know mm -hmm. what ours is? Um, only a few months, right? I don't know, yeah. Six weeks? Six, six, six months? <clears throat> yeah. I, th this might be irrelevant. It just reminded me, just the po crappy police training in America along with just not really teaching gun safety here. I, I had a friend when I was a kid, she lived only, only a few houses down. Uh, his, his dad said he, he was originally going to, to an academy to become a police officer. And uh, he had another friend that, that was in, in the academy too. While they were training with guns, apparently they hadn't been taught the proper safety yet. Before they were given the guns, his friend accidentally shot himself, killed himself. So my friend's dad just dropped mm -hmm. out, didn't, yeah, didn't pursue it, didn't, didn't keep going. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I, my opinions are, are um, probably pretty emotional about it. I'd have to have somebody reasonable talk to me about why we need that many guns, as opposed to that's my Second Amendment right. Yeah, I don't. I don't think anyone needs a freaking arsenal. I, I, I agree with everything you said, save for one thing. I, I do want firearms eventually, just two. Okay. Just a handgun and a shotgun, which I would never buy scatter shot for because I don't trust the inaccuracy of that. Yeah, you know, and I, I don't necessarily think we have to take guns away from people. I just think we have to have some really serious common sense conversations about the types of guns that are actually necessary for self protection. The kinds of training that must be required. My daughter had to drive. How long? I mean, more cars kill people. Yeah, but okay. Distracted driving is a problem as well. That's why you know the mm -hmm. driverless cars are kind of that's a great more idea. People, probably more people own cars, and cars are in much more active use. Everyone's always outside in them. Yeah. <laughs> It's not like everyone's constantly walking around firing yeah, guns. Yeah, cars are more dangerous than airplanes, <laughs> but you got a lot more people that are afraid of cars or airplanes than cars. So, I mean, we could have these round and round and round arguments, but right. um, we got to stop. We got to. It has to. It has to stop being so damn easy for people to kill kids and for people to kill each other. It's just got to stop. And I don't know how to make it stop because they don't do a whole lot of research. They don't put a whole lot of money into gun violence research. Mm -hmm. If we put a lot more focus on the background checks and the psychology behind everything, mm -hmm. then we can catch a lot of these problems before they ever become problems. Education. Education. Really honest, open conversations that don't start with, you're trying to take this away from me or you're trying to mandate this, whatever. Well, if you can mandate my reproductive care, then I think we can have an open, honest conversation about your damn guns. Right? Yeah. You can tell me, you know. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, All right, yeah. Now I right, I get all fired up. <laughs> I always, I, I I've brought up the, the point before that when 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 the Constitution was written, when the Second Amendment was was written, they were talking about muskets. They were talking, like you said, guns that reload really friggin' slowly. But people always use the argument that, and and it is true. This was why it was originally written that. The, the intent was so they have weapons to fight back against the government in case the government ever gets out of hand. Well, arms is very generalized. That doesn't just mean firearms, because that's all the Second Amendment said. Arms. The government has missiles. We can't... Do, <laughs> yeah. do you want to give every civilian missiles? Because that's the way would like be a on par. tank. <laughs> <laughs> there well. are countries, I believe uh, the UK <laughs> is one of them, where you you can actually have a demilitarized tank. There's even places in America you can have. Streets. Even places in America you, have, you can have tank. No functioning cannon, but you can have a tank. Yeah, it has to be dem <laughs> demilitarized, but there, yeah. there are places nice. in the world where you can actually have bulky <sighs> military vehicles like that. Do you, see, do you know how like cool that. I'd be? Driving down the freeway at my 25 miles an hour in my tank. <laughs> Julia yeah. for Congress. <laughs> That would be I think if that, that, would that be you ridiculous. would swing a lot of Republican votes. I might votes. swing a lot of Republican <laughs> votes. I might. I really might. Oh my gosh. On that note, we have got to end. <laughs> you guys, thank you so much. This of has course. been a great conversation. I like talking. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> oh, I, I do too. It's I, good though. I, li I, I like I to be I love having engaged. intelligent conversations. That matters to I'm, me a lot. That really matters to me a lot. And uh, you know, when, you, when you're open 
to having conversations, then that means you you know what to ask and you also know how to listen and, and the engagement is incredible. Mm -hmm. That's we talk a lot in my classroom. The kids just, you know, they have something to say and it matters to me that somebody listens to them to do that. I hope I never got too debatey. I, I, I tried to No, you apologized a couple of times. No, no, no. Myself. But I think I, but the thing is is though <laughs> again, you you challenge me to respond to particulars of you said something earlier and I wanna expand on that and I think that matters because you can't just have these lofty ideals without any sub substantive you know back up right. if I say I want to do this that well how are you going to do that and if everybody just accepts that I'm, I know she wants to do this well how are you gonna do it how, like oh, it has to really have some grit to it it's got to have some 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 like I said some substance to it otherwise I'm just another blah 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 and I don't ever want to be accused of being a a, a politician no. not in the form of dirty word i'd love to no. be mr smith yeah. goes to washington kind of a thing that's why i also love how you keep bringing up that you're talking to other people experts that know more about a particular subject right. than you do to to gain the knowledge sure you, you want to know how this works you don't have the years and years and years of experience with it so you want to go to someone who right. does yeah, talk to people in the healthcare industry and economists to talk about money. We have to, you know, I can I can answer things about parenting, but I can't answer things about parenting a special needs child. So I have to have those conversations. Like right. how does and, and I can have conversations about education because I've been entrenched in it with my own children and then myself as my career. So there are certain things that I feel a little more expert on, even though I do, still don't know everything. And so there are there are certain I got some really good answers for certain questions, but I still, again, as I mentioned before, I got to keep learning. I have to keep learning, and I don't want to be accused of being a know-it-all because that's that's unfair. That's uh, that's that. Then I'm closed. Now I'm closed off. If I think I know everything and I have all the answers, then I've closed myself yeah, off. I, to I definitely open like that conversation. mentality. Also, now now I really do kind of want to have eventually have another discussion, just purely philosophical, just back and forth. Fantastic. Don't even have to record it. Just perfect. Perfect. I, I just Looking forward to it.